We're here. Yeah. Thank you. So excited to see all of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you for being on the call. Thank you for being on the call. You're actually the fifth country uh, on the virtual Africa funding. If you congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um I'll just you're welcome. You're welcome. So I'll proceed um, with. A round of introductions. I will introduce the objective of the uh, uh, this virtual review, and uh, and then we move forward. The whole meeting actually um, is 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 actually to strengthen uh, you all to strengthen your businesses. If you could all just mute your, your, your phones, that would be good, or your... Thank you, Dr. Roland. Yes. So welcome Malawi, uh, the fifth uh, country on our Africa Funding to a virtual review um, calls. Um, this is such a good time and such an exciting time for us in the process uh, of preparations towards the Africa Funding Tour. And I am personally so, so, so excited to have come this far with you and, and to see how the next steps uh, play out. My name is Nyakan June. I'm the CEO and founder for the Timeless Women of Work Growth and driving that growth primarily through women. Uh, I'm also the CEO for the Timeless Dynamic Services Limited. Um, that's really looking at um, bringing uh, business, um, you know, um, collaborative partnerships between players outside of the continent of Africa and players inside of the continent of Africa and implementing very tangible projects such as this one um, to drive Africa's uh, transformation and, and economic growth. So really, really glad to be on this call um, uh, with me um, as part of this introductory process is Dr. Roland Roberts, who is the CEO uh, for Courageous, also an advisor to national governments and an enterprise um, expert. Um, Dr. Roland and myself uh, through Courageous and Science Dynamic Services are actually leading the Africa funding tour that's going to take place over six uh, African countries. And this is really the first of its kind in Africa, a pioneer you know, uh, funding tour. Yes, I think we might have lost Nanak in there for just a moment, but I'm Dr. Roland and, uh, you know, we're very thrilled to bring uh, this funding tour uh, to, to the continent. And what's unique about yes. it is that we have the uh, American investors and, and others that uh, are interested in investing in Africa because they see the potential as really the last economic frontier. Uh, you're at, uh, you're kind of where China might have been in their economic wise uh, 30 40 years ago whenever things were just starting to open up except you have more freedom to be able to start businesses and promote entrepreneurship in uh, in the countries and that is how you build wealth for your you yourself your family your, your children uh and, and their children and so uh, entrepreneurship is the single greatest economic engine on the planet today it is the great leveler of all people, regardless of gender, race, where you are, what you have, what you don't have, entrepreneurship levels the playing field because uh, you because it's a matter of creativity, it's a matter of persistence, it's a matter of uh, ingenuity, and um, there is hardly a people on the planet more more persistent and, and uh, ingenuous and, and and more tenacious and with more spirit and passion and faith than the African person. And so the African entrepreneur. And so I love seeing this and we're thrilled. Uh, you know, we've been in the middle of the global pandemic with you as well. Uh, and so investors, you know, uh, you know, there was initially, we started having questions, uh, you know, do they still want to go? Will they still travel outside of the country and go to a place where maybe they've never even been before? Uh, and the answer uh, has been yes. 
uh, because they believe in this. They believe in the process that you're going through. I think that's important to understand. Uh, they're not going because they just want to hear about businesses. Uh, they hear about businesses all day, every day, right now from some of the best, and they have pretty presentations and everything is finessed, and they they turn them down. What is interesting here is that you have gone through a process, uh, and you'll hear from the funding team and the business advisors, the legal advisors, and they are we're curating your businesses uh, so that you present them in the best light possible. And after after days and and listening to hundreds of business owners. Uh, share their businesses. I can tell you most African enterprises sell themselves short. Uh, they, they have m more assets and a stronger business than sometimes they give themselves credit for. Uh, and then of course there are some times where they say all kinds of things and they're going to, you know, lasso the moon and that's not real either. So, so this process is about helping you, uh, speak specifically and articulately uh, and factually uh, to investors. Investors are deciding to invest in you, not just in your idea. You're probably not going to tell them an idea that they ha don't, haven't already heard, okay? The difference is not, is it a new idea? It's, do I believe you can execute it? Do I believe you can get the job done? When things get hard, will you give up or will you keep going and find a way around the problem or the challenge? Uh, that's, uh, investors are not institutions. They're not buildings. They are people. And when they invest in your, you, your, your company, they're not investing in, in a building. They're not investing in, in a company because that's not a person. They can only give money to another person. They're investing in you. And so uh, the purpose of this call is really for us to be able to hear uh, your business and then be able to provide some some quick feedback. You're not having to sell us on your business. Uh, we really want to prepare you so that when you speak in front of us in August in person, that you are sharp, uh, your message is honed, and you say what you need to say. You're only going to have like two minutes, two minutes to share your business and how much funding you're looking for and uh, how much your sales are. Uh, and, and what business you're in. If I, I can, if you tell me those three things in 30 seconds, I can pretty much tell and know where I want to take the conversation. The biggest mistake investors make is they do all the talking. The, or excuse me, that, that the business owners make when pitching to investors is the business owner does all the talking. The best thing you can do is say, here's my business. Here's how much revenue I'm doing. Here's how much uh, net profit I have. And here's how much money I'm asking for. Uh, and then be quiet. And then we have questions already just knowing that information. Um, and so uh, that's the best way to allow it to happen. And that's also the way to get more than two minutes. If you keep talking, then they just, uh, you know, cut you off. So uh, let's go ahead. Uh, I know uh, we'll introduce uh, Steve Galia, who is one of the uh, heading up the advisory and appraisal and valuation teams. So uh, Steve, uh, welcome, and I'll let you share a few words. Thank you, Dr. Roland, and uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm very, very excited uh, to see such a large number of potential uh, businessmen of the future. And uh, I must tell you guys that uh, you actually have a very unique opportunity. You know, it's, it's not every day you find uh, investors looking for projects to put in money. Yeah? Usually you'll find somebody who's got a good idea and now it's their responsibility to look for those investors. So you've got a very unique opportunity where you are able to showcase your projects to your potential team of investors. And uh, I think it, it's very, very important that uh, you be very well prepared, uh, very well prepared and have that entrepreneurial mindset that uh, Ronald was talking about. We need fresh ideas. Investors want to look at projects that, first of all, the realistic projects, the exciting projects, and there is potential for, for growth and a good return for them. Yeah. So even as, as you put together your proposals, as you put together your case, just bear in mind that uh, people are willing to put money into good ideas and good people. As Roland said, they're actually investing in you. Yeah. So the way you sell yourself is, is extremely important. 
And uh, in, in Kenya, there was a program called uh, the Lion's Den, the Lion's Den, where people are asked to come up with ideas for investment and you go and pitch in front of potential investors. And they gave you roughly 10, 15 minutes for you to make yourself, make your pitch. Yeah? And some of those, some of those people pre presenting, when they just had the first two or three, uh, the first one or two minutes, the, poten the, the, the potential investors could see very clearly that this is not a workable idea. Yeah? And uh, they don't give you the time. You know, they tell you, you know what, I've had you and I don't think this idea is workable. So be very clear about really what you want to achieve in terms of your projects. Be very, very clear about sort of money you're going to make from that business. Be very, very clear about how much of that money you're able to pay your potential investors. So viability of your idea is extremely important. So you do enough research in terms of the market, in terms of the competition, what competitive advantage do you have, and then make up your mind, decide based on the numbers, based on the numbers, is this idea sellable or not? Is it, is it a bankable idea or not? So all I can tell you is that you've got a really wonderful opportunity to sell your ideas. And uh, our, our, really the, the aim of this, this whole conversation today is to listen to you and maybe give you some more uh, feedback, some pointers as to how you, can improve your, how you can improve your proposals. So all I can say is that good luck to all of you and, 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 and well done. Thank you. Um, thank you, Steve, um, for that intro. Um, really good to have you on the call. Um, I wanted to, to, to see um, if Michelle had come on the call, but maybe I don't think so. Maybe she'll join us shortly. Um, so Malawi, um, just a bit of background. Um, Steve Legalia is actually um, a financial consultant, um, you know, analyst um, with the PwC and other global financial institutions. He's a former chairperson uh, of ISPAC Kenya. He chairs a lot of uh, a number of, uh, of boards, many boards actually. In Kenya, he's known as chair general because he's the chair of so many boards, you know, and um, he's also the CEO for FG uh, Solutions. So he is actually um, uh, a member of our technical uh, team um, and leads the appraisal committee. Uh, for all the submissions that are coming in um, in all the six countries. So thank you so much, um, Steve, for being on the call. When Michelle does come on the call, I will introduce her. Um, I've been looking out for Cecilia as well. Um, I haven't seen her yet on the call. Um, but, you know, uh, just to introduce them in absentia, Cecilia Kaisha is actually um, the lead, um, you know, technical person for the entire technical team a team that comprises of legal advisors, business development support officers and analysis. She's actually this, the, the, the executive director for um, Underwriting Africa and, and you know, is working very closely with us to, to lead that whole um, team, all our teams in that, in that area. Uh, Michelle is, um, and, and we'll hear a little bit about and, and from Michelle when she joins us. Uh, Michelle is actually the lead analyst, uh, working with a team of many other analysts who you will keep seeing on the call, I hope. A number of them do come on the call once they're able to, but Michelle will be representing them and giving, um, you know, a summary of the process so far. What are the preliminary outcomes, observations, and what recommendations that they have, you know, as the technical and analysis teams uh, for you, the project owners, in order to strengthen your submissions. So uh, I then want to move to Molly Moniki to say hi. Molly is our regional uh, project lead uh, for Timeless. And I know all of you know her more than you know other people on this call, but Molly, say hello, please. Hello, everyone. Hello, Malawi. It's, I'm very much glad that you're here. And uh, we look forward to a very interactive moment. And thank you all for logging in. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you so much for being on the call. Yeah. Um, this vibrant uh, team of enterprises uh, based in, in Malawi have been working very, very cl closely um, with our Timeless Women Network representative in Malawi, Nasreen um, Shohat. And uh, Nasreen um, also leads our Timeless programs in Malawi and has been working very, very closely on this project, working with our enterprises there. Um, um, Nasreen, welcome to the call. Maybe you can give a bit of... Um, you know, you can say hello and give some insights and expectations that you would have on this call. 
for Malawi. Hi, everyone. I'm here. Thank you, Madam Yakan. Thank you to all of you. Um, uh, and we're looking forward to being here and also looking forward to asking our questions. So, yeah, Malawi, be ready with your question. This is your time. This is your chance. This is this is it <laughs> after this that's it that will be the last of your projects going through and make sure you ask every question that you have so that you strengthen your proposal thank you all <laughs> thank you Nasri. and thank you so much for the the, the, the leadership that you're providing and the, and the hard work that you've put in uh, with our technical teams to prepare. So um, just before we go into the um, next um, uh, round you know, of this, this introductory process, we would love to hear from your, you, the enterprise owners, the project owners. would love to know your name, you know, your project, which sector are you in? Uh, what size of funding are you looking for? Okay. Um, and, and please make your introduction brief and precise because there's a lot of you on this call. You're almost 60 of you on this call. And, um, and I know that's you know, just a portion of, of all the enterprises. Each, each of the country teams that we've, we've done the virtual calls with, you know, there was just a portion of the, of the, of the, the full submissions that, that were on the call. And, and yours is quite big. Um, so let us uh, make it very, very efficient so that as many of you can, can speak as possible, as many of you can get a chance uh, to have an engagement and insights from the team that's, that, that's, that's online. And, 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 you know, we can be able to also enrich, you know, um, your, your, your thinking around your project from the feedback that you receive. Before we get to that, I'd love to just uh, paint the picture about Malawi. Malawi is a country in the southern part of Africa, a country that's very, very close to my heart. <laughs> and every time I talk about Malawi, I just cannot, uh, you know, avoid having a smile on my face. Um, it's really, really a country that has um, been termed poor for very, very long, but on the, on the verge and the brink of a turnaround and a breakthrough into that next level. Uh, Malawians are now, you know, embracing enter, enter, enterprise and enterprise development as a strategy for, for their nation's economic growth, which is really good. They enjoy a lot of government uh, support. And uh, some of the focus areas for Malawi, very green country, very beautiful, very arable, very productive. You know, the people, the land, everything is so productive in that, in that space. Um, some of the focus areas for Malawi are, you know, agriculture, and you'll find there's a lot of conversations, uh, you know, focus, you know, focus area priority in terms of policy, resource mobilization, and allocation towards the agricultural um, sector. Uh, Malawi was able to, to, to break from, from you know, hunger and, and food insecurity about six to seven years ago, so that the last six to seven years has seen them positioning themselves, not just, not just as you know, uh, producers for food for their country, but they're now exporting to countries such as India, you know, in Asia and other others, especially when it comes to grains uh, and, and, you know, and dried foods. So really, really good to see how entrepreneurs have really, you know, taken the challenges that they have faced and turned it around to an opportunity that will just not work for the country, but also, you know, beyond the country as a revenue generation, um, you know, option for, for, uh, for building their economy. Um, I know that the submissions uh, from the feedback from our technical teams uh, uh, in Malawi, it's a whole diverse array of, of ideas and sectors. I'm sure uh, when the technical team begins to speak, they will be able to to share you know, some of those uh, sectors that we've observed. So uh, with that said, I'd love to move on to um, very quick, crisp introductions from uh, you project owners. We'd love to hear your voices. We'd love to hear uh, what your project is about, what sector and keep it deep, keep it precise. And you can do, use this as a practice, you know, a template uh, for what will be going on in August, okay? So I will begin with um, Teboho Namane, your first.
Go ahead, Tabaho. I can I believe Stephen uh, Tesulo is ready to go on video. Okay. All right, let's let's move then. Uh, Stephen. Hello. Greetings. Uh, greetings to you too. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, so my my business idea is about uh, printing, photocopying, and branding. I have a printing shop in Juju, and I'm actually I'm currently doing it in uh, the, at the Juju University. But I'm looking for branding to actually expand and go into branding for organizations and companies because we don't have that in the whole of the northern region. Uh, when people want when companies want to brand, you have to do the branding and uh, the large printing uh, presses. They, they all have to go to the long way and plant there. So I'm looking for funding to actually expand my business. So Stephen, how, how much uh, are you looking for in funding? Uh, so far we're looking for about 34 million. Malawi quite. Okay. And how, how much are you doing right now in revenue? Uh, in revenue, uh, I would say we make about uh, 400, between 400 and 500,000 project a month yeah because okay, uh, so well, that's a month so six six million a year yeah yeah I can say that. very good how how uh if 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 you raise six million what are you doing with that investment how does it grow your revenue um Come on, again. How does the investment, how will the investment grow your revenue? Hello. Hi, Stephen. Hello? Hi. How, yeah. how, yes, how much will the, the investment grow your revenue? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, if, 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 if I can get the revenue, I'm looking at, um, Maybe a minimum of uh, maybe 1.5 or. One five million a month, maybe for the first year, but then going beyond, going, going ahead, it should be way, way, way more than that. Okay. So you think it will double your sales. Okay. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Thank you so much. Now you can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So thank you. Okay. That's Celia. Rosie. Steven, I think Talita is next, up next. Talita. Salome, are you ready? I'm Talita here. All right. Go ahead, Talita. I'm Talita here. Yes, go ahead, Talita. Uh, my name is Talita Chitsulo. I'm operating as dual and food processors. We do process a range of a range of products from peanuts. So we are we are looking for eighty five thousand US dollars investment. We just want to purchase a an automated machine in the event for delivery as well as working capital. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Talita, how much revenue are you, is your peanut processing uh, doing right now? As of now, every month we sell about 1 million Malawi kwacha every month. 
Okay. And what do you need to grow? What were you doing? We, with need to grow. Uh -huh. we really need to grow because we are not able to reach the whole country and we also want to start exporting. Okay. And we also want to add value to the peanut butter to come up with another product. Very it's more nutritious. Yes. Yes. So yeah. to expand distribution and to export. Uh, yes, and export. Yes. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Congratulations on your business. Very well. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you so much. You're brief and precise. Um, Salome, are you, you're up next. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, well, Rox is general enterprises. We basically into agriculture, poultry farming. Currently, we're doing quails, uh, chicken, and we also build incubators. It's a family business, but we want to expand it. We're based in Blante in Zomba, but we want to expand the business to Lilongwe. We're looking for a funding funding of 93,000 US dollars. We also want to add value. We want to extend our incubation services or other farmers who are not able to purchase their own incubators, but also don't want to do hatching services. We also service the incubators, so we want to expand more on our business. How big is your business right now? Right now, we build about 10 incubators in a month, and we're raising about 5,000 plus birds in a month. So we sell even live birds and also add value, we sell them as breast birds. And what year did the business start? We started in 2016. 2016, okay. Yes, yeah. Very good. On the, on the incubation side, but rearing of the quail started in 2029, 2009. Yes, okay, very good. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Super, thank you so much, Salome. Very good insights. Um, next, we have Fanny. Fanny, are you ready? Hi, I'm ready. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Fanny Gondwe. I'm the executive director of Felicia Agro and Packaging Enterprise. We are based in Nilongwe. I'm an entrepreneur in agribusiness, and our main focus is on three value chains. Uh, we are into seed multiplication of orange fresh sweet potato the vines and cassava cuttings and we also process orange fresh sweet potato flour and puree and we are also processing cassava into cassava starch high quality cassava flour and fermented flour which is condori and now we have expanded we are also processing uh, animal feed poultry feed from the waste of Cassava peels and sweet potato peels. So we are looking for 70,000 US dollars. We want to expand the, the uh, waste management business. We are want to go into energy also by processing fire briquettes. Thank you. Thank you and very concise and um, congratulations on your business. Uh, give me an idea of how, what size you are right now in, in revenue or in, in production. Yeah, so uh, putting together all our businesses, our annual turnover is around 60,000 US dollars. Okay, so your annual revenue right now is around 60,000 and then you're looking yes. at 70,000 US investment. Uh, Let's say that you get 70,000 in US investment. How much revenue do you think you'll do next year if you get that investment? Yeah, so if I get that 70,000 US dollars, uh, that means next year we'll grow up to maybe 90 to 100,000 US dollars because we are expanding. So we are also uh, expanding on the uh, supply chain management with our contract farmers who are uh, producing the roots for our processing. And we are also expanding in terms of the sales. Very good. Very good. And so does the 70,000 investment, uh, is that going into supply chain management or distribution or what, where, uh, 
why does that money increase sales? Where you put that? Yes, so uh, the 70,000 US dollars, we are looking at the uh, processing equipment for the fire briquettes. We already have the equipment for processing poultry feed, but we don't have the equipment for the uh, fire briquettes. And also, it will also go to um, market research development, packaging and branding, and all those other things, and the building for the processing. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, Fanny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe just a question for Fanny. Uh, in, ter in, ter in terms of the target market, what's, what's your target market? Yeah, so our target market for the fire briquettes is uh, where uh, we are staying, where we are based is Likuni, and we are housed with uh, Chinsapo, Chibirizano. These are uh, like uh, the ghettos where there's a lot of waste. So we want to use that waste, turn it to fire briquettes, uh, in addition to the waste that we accumulate from the uh, sweet potatoes and the cassava. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Fanny. Uh, yeah. Fanny, one more question for you. Sorry, Dr. Roland. Uh, Fanny, can you talk, talk, talk a little bit more about um, what you're doing with the sweet potato and cassava leaves? the waste from that. Can you tell us what you're doing with that? Okay, fine. So it's the potato peels, the waste. Okay, what we are doing is we are processing orange faced sweet potato into flour and puree. So the waste we accumulate from the orange faced sweet potato and the cassava peels. In cassava, we are processing a cassava starch, high quality cassava flour, and the condole. So the peels that we accumulate from the uh, sweet potato and the cassava, we turn it into potato feed. We add uh, soya and maize and other additives, so we make potato feed. Ah, okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I see that you're really a lot into value addition, you know, and post waste have in post harvest waste management, you know. So that's good. It's good. It's good to see how you can streamline those as in you know into very different product lines that can actually give you a source of revenue and product offerings, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you. Pastor Gabriel, Pastor Gabriel? Dr. Roland, have you seen anyone else who's ready? Yes, we have three uh, hands. Yeah, uh, Nan is that Nancilia? Yes, it is. Please go ahead. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Greetings. My Absolutely. my name is Nancilia Morozi. Yes, I am Nancilia yes. Morozi. I am uh, the managing director of Ants Enterprises, which is into fashion and design. We are very much into sewing anything that can be sewn from school uniforms, from bags, from clothing, office wear, beach wear, everything we are in it. Now the funding we are looking for is, I want to come up with an African village where everyone in Africa is going to be accommodated. We are going to do something that is traditional from the space which we are going to have we are going to have everything traditional. Then we are going to be into departments where we are going to sew our traditional school uniforms, um, um, parastatals uniforms, all that is being sewn from the natural cloth that we have got. Not like, um, uh, what do you call it? Not, not like the ordinary office, but we want to be real traditional where it is Africa is seen from, like we are the face of Africa in Malawi. Whatever you want to get, it, it, it can be sculpture, wood or stone, it can be clothing, it can be food. We are into that. So I want funding for that to take up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nincilia. You know, my, my first thought is, so, 
correct me if I'm wrong, you're wanting to create your vision is a village uh, yes. uh, where uh, people are able to sew and uh, really artisans and crafts craftsmen, people to make certain things. Is that what your vision is? That is my vision, exactly. And I would like also to be an employer of those who are um, uh, lowly, lowly looked for after. Like, there are people who are so very much uh, looked down upon. Those who cannot help themselves, they'll be part of that village. We will like raise people, train people, maybe in sewing, maybe in artistry, maybe in um, growing food for the village. We won't be buying from anywhere else. We want to have our own farm where we are going to be um, raising up chickens, pigs, uh, goats, um, agriculture for the farm. So it will be real traditional where we are taking things from our farm into our village. And then we are now teaching people like those, um, uh, orphans, um, mothers who have been dro who dropped out of school because of a lot of reasons. Maybe it's money, maybe it's sickness, or whatever it is. So we also want to expand our village into community um, funding as well, or maybe community empowering. Deaf people having to have their lives from that village, despite yeah. the fact that we are also looking at people who are going to enjoy our village looking at Africa through this village. That's my vision. Thank you for that. How much money are you seeking investment funding? Right now I'm seeking for 33,000 US dollars because I want a place which is going to be big enough to accommodate all the vision I've been talking about because we need a farm. We need a place to uh, come up with all these things we are, I'm talking about. So I'm looking for about 33,000 US dollars. Okay, thank you. And then one final question. Um, Many of the things that you have in your vision are things that you can be doing uh, without having a central place, at least for it, it'll work better when you have this village. But uh, so are, are there people right now that you are mentoring, uh, perhaps young ladies that you're mentoring uh, with pig raising or with sewing or in any of these things? Like, are you already doing some of these things? Yes, I've got about three um, ladies who I'm mentoring now. I'm just uh, helping them in coming up like uh, employment. But my real vision is to have a place where they will really be uh, working and seeing how they can also add value to the community. But now because of I don't have enough funds to expand, so why I, I like this... Uh, 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 green leaf, which has been ex uh, extended to this to Malawi, that we can also take part in making sure that people also are have got some people who care for them. So it's like the capital is what has drawn me back because I my vision it needs some support, which is financial. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. The more you can connect. The more you are, you mentioned the question, you, you are ready. All right, Caroline, are you ready? Caroline? Caroline, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, go ahead. Okay, my name is Karen Chuaya. Uh, I do business of school. I have a school, NASA school for now because I don't have anything to go on. But I want funding so that I can go higher with him. Nazare, primary, secondary, and even college. But for now, I want Nazare and primary. So I want I want you to help me with funding because I'm I'm on my rent. I'm renting my school. Okay, so you have a school. Uh, what age? Yeah. Okay. 
Come again? Ali, Ali, Ali. One moment. Let me mute the uh, background noise here. Uh, one person has. Yes, I have a. Go, go ahead. How many students do you uh, have? Okay, for now I have 57 students. What, uh, yeah. is, uh, what age do you teach? Okay, from six months up to six years. Oh, so a daycare. Yeah, it's a daycare and the Nazar and, and the primary standard the one up to standard the three. Okay, and how much are you seeking in funding? I want 20 million because I want to have my own press. I want to buy press to build to build my own school and a pray grant for my kids. So I want 20 million. Marawi Kwaja. Okay. Uh do uh -huh. yes. Uh, what is the name of your school? It's New Dawn Private School. Okay. Yeah. Do you expect uh, more people to, uh, w will, the, will the new school be bigger to accommodate more students? Ex exactly. Because I have, a, my press is small, that's why I have this amount of, of children, 57. But if I have a large press and more buildings, I'm, a, I'm expecting to have more children because of that space. You know, uh, structures is something that you, People are, are people look to for their kids to be enrolled in that school. That's why I'm looking for to have my own and a beautiful school so that I can have and I'll have many, many kids. Yes, that's that's great. Yeah. Uh, how, how much revenue are you doing right now? Oh, okay. For now, because every kid pays ten thousand. Marawi Kwaja, so it's like if I five hundred thousand. Hello. Yes, you, did you say five hundred thousand? No, five hundred thousand every month. I gain five hundred thousand. After paying my teachers, I I everything after removing everything, I remain with five hundred thousand. Marawi Kwaja. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the hot donor, there is a friend here. We are using one phone. So she want, she's led it too, if you are done with me. Okay. Yes, please. Very good. Thank you. You are most welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Alice Mloda. Nice to meet you, Alice. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, I want to start a, a restaurant like a takeaway at a certain place in Kodagoda. There's a lot of there. So I want to build a good structure there and have a restaurant a takeaway there since it's along the Lord. Lakeshore Road. So do you have a restaurant now? I no, as of now, I don't have. I just do small businesses, but I don't have the restaurant. So I want to start. I want to start. Yes. Now, do you cook or make things that you deliver yes. now? Okay. What kind of things do you cook? Come again. Come again. Uh, what uh, type of food do you make? I do this a piece of the banana. No, yeah, I'll be cooking there. I'll be making a lot, of, a lot of food there. But what kind of food do you make? Okay, local food, food, international food. Right now, what are the small businesses you're doing? What are you making right now? What small businesses are you are you doing right now? You know, you said you're doing some small businesses. Okay. Which ones are you doing now? Yeah, I just make. I just make some snacks, some cakes. I just sell in the shops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me just encourage you to keep doing that. Keep trying to add more shops that you can just uh, continue to sell more cakes to. Um, and uh, 
you know, because you may find that a mobile business may serve your customers better than an actual physical location, especially as it relates to cafes and restaurants. Uh, the restaurants can be very expensive and their cash goes up and down. Even in the United States, a lot of restaurants close, but the ones that are mobile delivery, uh, they stay in business because they don't have as much overhead. So they can expand and grow when, whenever the economy is good and they can contract without, without losing their business when it's tight. So uh, continue, I, I strongly encourage you to continue doing what you're doing um, and continue going through the timeless process so that uh, we can refine the, uh, the, the cafe, the restaurant idea. Uh, but uh, the team will need to really work on that to make sure that it's sustainable and viable because that's usually uh, a sizable investment. Uh, Thank you, Alice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. You're most welcome. Yes. Hi, Lena. Go ahead. Oh, that is Javula from Malawi. Hi, Lenas, yes. Yeah, so and uh, the managing director for Hungary Investments. Linus, carry on speaking. Oh, so we are launching and in processing that is smoking. Uh, making fish fillets and making fish powder sausages as well as sausages. So our aim is to uh, make sure that the demands of fish are met in Malawi and as well as across the, the country. So, Lanes, are you doing fish processing? Yes. How much revenue do you do now? Uh, it's... About 4,000 4, Malawi budget. Okay, so 4,000 Malawi, uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. How much? How, how much in funding? Uh, seventy thousand dollars. And what do you want to do with that money? Okay, so we want to buy a billeting machine, a sausage making machine. Um, small, uh, FFTQ, uh, used for smoke, we use for smoking fish. Okay. Uh, yeah. how much revenue, if you uh, as well as the refrigerated van for transporting. Hmm. Okay. So if you buy the equipment and the vehicle for transporting, how much revenue do you think you will do after an investment? Mm. More, more than one million per month. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Lanes. Oh, 
Hello, yes. I'm going to continue. Yes, Medica, who, who is on the line now? Yes, yes, I'm That's ready. Fine. Go, go ahead, uh, Milika. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Milika Chedeuka, operating under 3M Investments. Um, my vision is to grow um, an agribusiness entity in Lilongwe. Uh, that's to do animal husbandry and crop husbandry. Under animal husbandry, um, I want to do pigs, goats, and cattle. And then under crop husbandry, I'm looking into doing ginger, uh, ginger, bananas, and sugar cane. But currently, uh, as frame investment, we're, we're involved in buying and reselling of ginger. And then, um, I realized that there's a challenge in uh, the supply of ginger from my suppliers. So, um, in the immediate in the immediate term, I would like to invest much in the ginger production, and I'm looking for twenty seven thousand dollars for funding. We've got family land, which is about uh, 23 hectares, uh, which can be, I mean, which is ready for use. And uh, um, looking at ginger, ginger is very high on demand right now. And it's got, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's selling, um, it's, it's, re it's really selling at competitive prices internationally and locally. Okay, please. Yeah, please continue. Yes, thank you. Yes, um, so, um, but uh, we're planning to do our ginger differently in a way that um, we want to concentrate much on organic ginger production, yes. which um, I've already started on a smaller scale. Yeah. Which, uh, whereby we do an eight by four plots and uh, we invest uh, 100 kgs of ginger and we harvest about 1,500 kilos. Okay. And do you have any pigs, goats, or cattle now? Or is that what the investment... No, 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 no. I'm presenting as, as a startup, as a, as a startup business. I see. So you have 23 yes. hectares... Yes, of land. Right now. Family. Yes. And uh, you're doing, on a very small scale, this ginger... Yes, because yeah. initially I was into buying and reselling. So looking at uh, how low the supply was, which was also affecting my uh, selling, I decided to go into the uh, production myself. Okay. Uh, and but I haven't planted yet. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I've, um, I'm, I'm only doing the land preparation, pre preparation now. Yes. Yes. How much uh, were you asking for in funding? Twenty-seven thousand dollars. Twenty-seven. Yes, uh, to buy the seed. Actually, ginger seed is quite expensive, and also we want to grow ginger through throughout the year. So I might also I will uh, invest in uh, the irrigation system because okay. the the land already has uh, some water source. Okay, uh, yeah. so would any of the investment be used to uh, for uh, towards livestock, or is it all towards the ginger and irrigation? Yeah, um, currently I would want uh, first of all I would want to go into ginger, 
before I, I expand. And that would take, so just ginger would take the full investment? Pardon? Uh, would you spend all $27,000 on ginger? No, 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 no. Whilst, um, okay, I would, uh, I would invest uh, half of that into ginger and then the rest would be into building structures ready for the, for the uh, animal husbandry. Okay. Very yes. good. Very good. Thank you, Milika. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Nikon? Yeah. Turn it to you. Yeah. And, and Steve, uh, if you want to input, just uh, please feel free to just interject. Um, I've seen Mi Michelle is on the call now. Michelle, would you say hello? I'd just love to introduce Michelle. Uh, Michelle is the lead for our technical and appraisal and business advisory teams. She's our lead analyst that's working with all the projects. Michelle, can you say hello? Hi everyone. Hi Malawi. Um, I am happy to be here and I'm happy to give you feedback and I'm happy to work with you guys throughout this journey. So I'll be talking to you later. Thank you, Nikan. <laughs> You're most welcome. You're most welcome, <laughs> You're most welcome uh, Michelle. So the process that we've come through this far, you know, has been, uh, you know, a journey. We began with executive summaries. All those summaries have been appraised, analyzed, you know, categorized. And Michelle will be speaking later about the categorization <coughs> and we'll be giving insights into what you must do to strengthen these proposals. Obviously, our technical teams have been looking at these proposals from the lens and the eyes of investors. It's one thing to want money. It's another thing to know what you want the money for and to make sure that that money, when you get it, it's offering value and value back to the investor. It has to be a win-win all the way. So, so thanks, Michelle, for being on the call. Um, we can continue with the enterprises. Um, Steve, feel free to give insights as we go along, interject as, as, you, as, you, as you see needed. Sure. Um, who's up next? Um, Hi. Yes. Itai? Uh, Itai yeah, here. Next? I can go next. Itai. Okay, Itai. Yes, you can go next. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I run an enterprise called uh, The Season Farms. We are into hot culture and we, we pride ourselves as uh, the DNA of, of hot culture products. Um, we are currently producing high, what we call high value vegetables, uh, uh, red, yellow peppers, uh, zucchinis, uh, broccolis, and, and so forth. And our target is uh, the supermarkets and we are also targeting the middle income uh, households who are keen to pay a premium for vegetables that are uh, 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 dropped off at their homes. We are also looking broadly at the, um, the ordinary Malawian homes that are also becoming um, health conscious and we are also targeting the, um, the expatriate community in Malawi. At the moment, um, what we have also currently started doing in response to COVID is to increase our door-to-door -door, uh, vegetable home delivery service. And the, we have seen an increase in terms of the number of customers that we are able to target apart from the usual supermarkets and the hotels and other catering um, facilities. We are looking for, for at least 40,000 US dollars with 40,000 US dollars, we will be able to expand our production, which is currently uh, slightly above one hectare with uh, drip irrigation. And we will, so we will be able to increase another hectare and we should be able to purchase um, uh, a delivery van, a refrigerated delivery van that will help us to reduce our post harvest losses. Above all, we will, we will also be able to build uh, a park house where we'll be able to process our vegetables um, uh, package and, and store them in a um, cool environment, in a cooled environment. Um, apparently, we are, our revenue is around uh, between 14 and 20,000 US dollars. 
And with the injection that we are asking for, we see ourselves in the first year being able to go up by about um, between 50,000. And in the second year, we should be able to hit uh, around 70,000. And then going forward, we are looking at a growth rate of about 20 year in, year out. Thank you very much. Thank Maybe you just so a much, Itai. Question from Itai. Yeah. Thank you for that short and very clear presentation. So if, if you look you. at the nature of the business you're doing, uh, there are normally two big risks. And one of them yes. is uh, weather. And as you've taken care of by having a drip irrigation. And the next one is volatility of the products. Yeah. Yes. You may find that uh, the price of your products can vary. I mean, I'm just looking at what happens in Kenya. It yes. can vary by as much as 50%. Uh -huh. yeah. Have you taken care of that risk in, in, in your business plan? Okay, so what we have been, we have been planning, we've been farming for the past uh, three years. And um, in the past three years, what I've also been doing was to learn how the, the cycle is. So we know that there are seasons where, for example, tomatoes fetch very low. So what we are doing is we are still doing the local vegetables that people would buy, like the kales, the cabbages, and, and the, the, the Chinese vegetables. So those are the ones that we grow on a very large scale and they pay for our overhead. And, and, as, and then we also have a section where we are focusing on high value vegetables, the ones that we know that um, as much as the seasons will change, their pricing is usually constant. Just for your information, at the moment, every year Malawi imports uh, uh, high value or exotic vegetables worth 1.5 US million dollars. So the market is huge and the issue that most of the supermarkets and the hotels have been feeding back to us is around quality, is around consistency, is around the standards. And I think at our farm, what we've been doing the past three years was to work on that. So we have drip irrigation, which is responding to climate, um, climate variability. We are using shed nets um, and, and uh, we have water storage facilities and all the other little things that I have mentioned. So for us to be able to be relevant throughout the season, so the, the packers will be very critical, the refrigerated van would be very critical because that would also reduce um, the, the post office losses and make sure that we remain above average in terms of our product pricing as well. Good, good. Okay. Congratulations. I mean, you've done a lot in three years. Uh, you've had one hectare but to, to, to work, and um, but to get the business to this point um, where you're doing that kind of, you can't argue with results. And the fact that uh, you're doing 14 to 20,000 USD um, with that amount of land and without, uh, you know, a cooling process, a place to process and, uh, you know, adding a delivery van, adding a doubling your capacity really from Hector and then being able to store that and process it in a cool place. I, uh, I agree with your uh, revenue projections. I think it's, uh, uh, I, I do think that you would, you would be able to do a little bit, uh, just over double uh, by doubling the land because you'd be able to preserve more of your original crops uh, with being able to store it and cool it. So uh, I think it's, I think you're asking for, I mean, uh, for probably around the right amount, depending on what that extra hectare would cost. Uh, and a delivery van would cost, but uh, you have a good business and a fundable business and uh, encourage you to just keep going through this process. But thank you very much thank for you. sharing, Tai. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Roland, I appreciate. Yeah, Tai, I have one question for you. Who are your current competitors? Who are your current uh, competitors? And is there anybody doing pack houses right now? Yeah, is there anybody doing pack houses right now? Um, Competition is out there. There are a number of um, other farmers that are doing similar work than the, uh, to what we are doing. But the difference that we pride ourselves in is that we grow our own vegetables on the farm. We usually harvest our vegetables on the day of delivery, so that's within 24 hours. And that has actually helped us to carve uh, a niche in the market. So if you walk into the supermarket, I will tell you that those are my vegetables. So we've actually had uh, conversations with supermarkets like ShopRite who are willing to reduce, uh, or if at all possible, 
stop importing some of the high value vegetables that they are currently importing because they have seen the quality that we are producing. So I would say our niche is the quality on the day harvesting and delivering within 24 hours. Most of uh, the competitors, they also don't have uh, pack houses. So that's a challenge actually here in Malawi. And, and adding that to our, our facility would be a huge plus. And we would actually use it to generate more income because I know there are quite a few of the farmers that are around me that would also want access to a cooling facility that, that they can actually use to store their vegetables. And that may become one of your primary businesses, quite frankly, as you grow. Uh, yeah. I have shared that uh, sometimes it's better, that, uh, you know, like during a gold rush, it's better to be uh, selling picks and shovels than mining for gold. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. <laughs> yes. So when you're serving the business owners, uh, mm -hmm. serving all of the other small farmers, you actually do very well. So I, I think you're headed the right direction. Yeah, and one thing that we would also want to add on to our business is access to very good seeds. It's, it's something that I didn't talk about, but going in the next five years, we would want to be able to be supplying very good disease-free seedlings for all the farmers around. So that's, that's where we would want to go in the future. But for now, we are focusing on what I've just said. Yes, no, that's yeah. great. On the seeds, be sure you develop a strong brand, a sticky brand. Yeah. Uh, because you want it to be known, yes, in Malawi, but even outside of Malawi, that if you want the best seeds, you get and then the name of your brand. So make it easy to say. Don't uh, make it uh, easy to remember and, uh, and, and short. Um, but, but brand it sticky because uh, th that's what equates to value. And that'll serve you well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so, really much, so much excitement. Yeah, yeah, so much excitement and interest in uh, in in your project Itai. You know, um, in addition to that, when you applying seedlings, means you're you're expanding. You know, your product yeah. your production through other farmers as well, because they'll be growing your seedlings, right? And yes, and yeah. and, uh, and increasing production in the market for your high value vegetables, right? So yes. again, you go into yes. aggregation, into aggregation, yes. being an aggregator, you know, and contract yes. farming and things like that. So so just factor that in your thinking, maybe short term, medium term, long term. Uh, you know, and see where it is that you want to start for this particular stage of the, of, of you know, of, of our funding tour. Yeah. Where do you want to start in August? Yeah. And I think you have that okay. very clearly. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate your feedback. You're most welcome. Thank yeah. You. So maybe we move next. Um, Salome has spoken. Scholar sticker. Okay, Tai. If No, Tai is just gone. Scholar sticker. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, interestingly, um, my business is also similar to Itai. So I'm um, managing director for Godada Investments, and I'm aiming to do greenhouse farming and food rehydration. Mm -hmm. um, most of the food in Malawi that is grown is late waste. So that's why I'm coming up with the food processing as in food re re rehydration. And um, greenhouse farming as well. Uh, I think in Africa, especially in Malawi, we are not certain about the rains and everything. This will also enable me at least to plant maybe three times a year. Uh, the vegetables, especially, I'm also looking for high value uh, vegetables, eggplants, tomatoes, uh, and the like. And um, the funding that I'm looking for uh, will be quite high, about $270,000, because I'm looking at uh, investment in greenhouses, drip irrigation, solar equipment, um, and also um a, a, a van so in, in investing in solar we also uh uh be able maybe to do water harvesting as well um but uh, at the end of the day i think we are looking at a revenue of the first year of maybe seventy thousand uh, dollars growing to ninety five thousand dollars in the next year i'm also uh aiming at yeah, helping 
the community, the farmers around who, who are my competitors, especially in tomatoes. What I would do is when there's, we have uh, over production of tomatoes, I will be engaged in rehydration. And in the time when the tomatoes are not growing very well, that's when I will, I will produce them. So initially, that's what I'm looking uh, to in my business. How long does it take you to grow a tomato with greenhouse farming? I haven't really... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't really done it, but uh, I'm, I've been looking at, I think, Kenyan farmers where they've done a lot of that. And I think I'll need a lot of uh, uh, research uh, doing that. Okay. I'll have, what, what I've done is we ha we have, I have a, a place in Blanta where we have been doing a, a subsistence farm, farming in a, in, for a long period. There's water there, but to get the water to do irrigation and all that, that's the challenge. So I, I have a lot of work to do to learn how to do this. But I think it's a, it's an, it, initially it might be a lot of um, the high cost investment, but in the long run, and especially I'm also looking for solar, solar powered equipment, because with uh, drip irrigation and it's automatic, and you are using solar, I think that would be a, a, a very good investment. So Scholastica, uh, that's a wonderful idea. I'm just looking at the, that part of your business here, you're doing rehydration of the products. And uh, I'm wondering, what, what's your target market? You know, most, most, uh, most consumers in Africa prefer to eat fresh food. Yeah. When you're selling to them dehydrated products, I don't know who's your target market here. Oh, my target market is most of the supermarkets because people really are looking for a healthy snack. So I've seen someone who was, who was doing it and they were doing to, I mean, mangoes, apples, even bananas. It's just that our fresh food got waste a lot. looking at you know receive that as an easy snack for anyone i'm sure that people's healthy have i mean eating habits are changing people want to eat healthy food that will be i think a a win-win solution in the long run yeah uh scholastica really really good to hear what you're talking about and i like the validation on uh, on on that you know additional offering for for the snacks um i think take take very keen note of branding the branding and the name that you want to brand your food and that you want to brand your snacks so that it stands out in the supermarket it stands out and stands out very early on because then it gives you early advantage especially if it's new in the in your market okay let your brand be catchy so that it gives you early advantage all right yeah yeah so so just looking at that and, and i like that you're handling post-harvest waste you know, as part of your, your, you know, your business and product offering. Congratulations on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. And all the best and all the best. Uh, Michelle, Michelle. Yeah. Michelle, did you already speak, Michelle? Uh, Nyakan, yes, I did introduce myself before. Oh, okay. All right. Anything else you wanted to say on that one? No, no, no. Steve has said it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just yeah. saw that uh, the mic was playing on you. Thank you for that. So there is a list here of people chatting me to create an order, which is good. Okay, so we've created an order on the chat. <laughs> yeah, so we will go with Irene, Steven, then Steven, and then Robson, and then Caroline, Masichikondi, and then we'll follow as it goes, okay? Uh, precious, yes, ready when the list clears, we keep going, okay? So Irene, if you're ready, uh, the mic is yours. Hi, uh, I'm Irene Kainga. I'm a singer. Uh, I have about, and I run a, a, a small musical school. I offer vocal lessons. I have about uh, uh, 20 students and I offer the lessons at home. And sometimes I do for them at their homes according to how we agree with the people from eight years and above. 
So I have this vision. I want to enlarge my school, uh, have like an orchestra, have an orchestra, uh, teach people how to play musical instruments, vocal lessons, having a, uh, dancing lessons. Yeah, that's my idea. And I need about uh, $120,000 because they, uh, uh, it's very, it needs a lot of money with the orchestra instruments, yeah. Uh, Irene, thank you for sharing your, your passion and, uh, and your voice. Uh, I, I'm sure it would be lovely to hear you perform. Um, so have you uh, researched how music schools operate in other countries? How they're doing? Uh, yes, I have. Yes, I have researched and I also have an idea because uh, the high school that I went to, they have a very good uh, musical setup. So I have an idea of how it runs. Okay. Yeah, uh, because a lot of times when you're going from teaching lessons, uh, singing, dancing, musical instruments, what have you, um, I will tell you two instances. Number one, uh, I have seen people in your situation that uh, three months ago when they were when COVID forced them online, their income has quadrupled, quadrupled. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if they were doing say thirty thousand USD annually uh they're doing over a hundred thousand usd now okay so, uh by doing the virtual uh lessons and it also was more time efficient for both people um and they could pay online uh or pay digitally uh so that you could accept payment um the other thing is scaling being able to scale a business like this uh, investors look for growth they like to see how you're going to make you know, revenues going to grow because of an investment. And um, if, if you really refine the business model uh, to also include maybe online lessons, then you can hire more teachers and, um, and, and keep class sizes small. Uh, but if you are going to go through with having a physical facility, um, usually that is a challenge. Um, uh, even the orchestras in cities in America, they have them formulated as nonprofits because they are considered, you know, an art, uh, one of the arts for the city. And while they are valuable to culture, it is difficult economically. It's difficult from a business perspective, which is why they usually require some type of city or government funding to con to support the mm -hmm. arts. So, uh, but I don't uh, I don't recommend you rely on government funding for your passion. That's why I suggest uh, really looking and evaluating your business model, trying to uh, really increase an online component. Or the other thing is. Uh, whatever the name of your music school is, have that academy to where uh, multiple people can teach out of your, uh, you can rent a building and multiple music teachers can use that if they don't want to use their home. And then you're getting an override off of all of those lessons, uh, even if you only taught a few lessons. So I think there are several different business models based on your passion. Um, but I would definitely, because I, I think you're going to have trouble getting 130,000 USD for this business uh, compared to some other investments, uh, because I don't think the return will be there. Uh, so you can get less investment and change the business model. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you have something you'd like to contribute there. Uh, okay, apart from yeah. the lessons. Uh, I'll also be hiring the place because I'll have a garden and maybe I'd have an auditorium so people can uh, pay for it. And then people can also come record their music using the skill. And also people can come in and also hire the instruments out. So I'll be making money from different, uh, from different areas apart from the school as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so Erin, I think, uh... As, as uh, Rona says, if you look at music, especially in, in most African countries, 
the people really go for lessons at the, let's put it the latest. And uh, in most countries, we find that uh, music conservatory is actually supported by, by either the city council or the government because as a business, it's very, very difficult to generate enough revenues and return for your shareholders. It would be very difficult. So maybe better look at the other offerings. You know, if you talk about hiring or whatever, probably look at whether that is feasible and whether you can develop that idea into a way that, that it can be attractive to investors. Just music and dance as, as a business, I can tell you, you struggle a bit in, in the African setup. Because people that go for them are mostly elitist, and, and that's a very small class of people. So you can't really generate enough revenues or profits for your for your shareholders. Irene, uh, one thing before you go, uh, I would ask that you consider doing an online concert. Uh, make sure you invite us all. You can charge five dollars USD, and uh, you know if you have a thousand people attending from around the world, uh, then you make five thousand USD. Uh, and you could just put on a concert every every Friday, or every once a week. Uh, so get creative. I know I would love to uh, see you perform. Um, so so get creative on, uh, on how you can expand your business model. Perfect. Yeah, um, I have a, a, a interesting. Hello. Yes, for Irene. I think there's a problem with my network, so I have stopped hearing you. Um. What did you hear last, Irene? What did you hear last? Hello. Yeah, what did you hear last? Yes, now I can hear it. What did you, whom did you hear last? Hello? Yes, Irene, we can hear you. What did you hear last? Uh, okay, I, 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 I think last time I heard was about them. Uh, it's very difficult to get all that money. Uh, Okay, so I think that you had uh, Roland talking about the, the, the money and investment in, um, you know, in the sort of like uh, school and everything. Immediately after him, Steve gave some feedback about the African context and then, so maybe Steve go again, because I think that input was so important for her. And then Roland, I guess, also what she said was important for her. You can go again, um, and then we can take it up from there. Steve, could you, could you just repeat what uh, insights Sure, sure, I'll do that. So, so I mean, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, you, you can have a passion in something. Uh, can you hear me, Irene? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me now? Hello? No, I can May I recommend that uh, Irene... No, get... I can't. That Michelle maybe take, take the feedback and, and put it into her, her submission. Maybe Michelle picks the feedback that we have given and put it into her submission yes. review. Yeah, okay. I think I agree with that. You hear yeah. what I said? Michelle? Uh, we've, uh, yeah. oh yes, Michelle. Michelle, Michelle are you there? You... Uh, Nayakin, we're fine to move on because we have this recorded. We can, uh, uh, just can, you can yeah. listen to let's, it. Let's move on, please. Okay. Yeah, okay. So next, um, we have um, Steven. Let's make it brief and precise because there's lots of you on the call. We're almost 70 now. So we really need to move along very quickly, okay? You're a big team. So Steven, um, go up next. If you could please just make it efficient, introduce your project, what you're looking for in funding, you know, and, and why you think your business is, is viable, okay? Steven. All right. Okay, hello. So I'm um, uh, the founder and we do waste management. And um, uh, our business basically is in two parts. First, we do household waste collection and we charge our, uh, the, uh, the people that sign up for our program um, about three pounds a month. And um, we also um, collect uh, waste from uh, different businesses and different companies. So right now we have one big uh, client, um, that's Total Malawi um, uh, Energy, uh, French Energy uh, Oil and Gas Company. Um, we're managing their waste right here in the long way and uh, in Zuzu, another city up north and another city down south in Blantyre. 
um, currently uh, from from um, you know House of West collection as well as um, from our corporate clients, we have a revenue uh, monthly revenue of uh, three thousand pounds. And um, uh, so what we're looking for is um, we're looking for eighty thousand pounds, and I would like to buy uh, three uh, refuse collection or bin wagons, um, as well as um, set up a recycling plant. Uh, where we could be um, recycling and make different environmental different products. Uh, currently, we uh, we have um, about two hectares of land uh, right in the middle of the city, long way, uh, where we are uh, recycling our waste. And um, also in Blanca and in Zuzu, we do the same thing. Uh, when we collect the waste from all trash outside, uh, we, hello. Yes, we're we're listening. In Blantyre and in Zuzu, um, we also have a partnership with um, National uh, National Commission for Science and Technology. And uh, through this partnership, we were given an opportunity last year. Uh, uh, we went to uh, Lancaster City Council, where we went to uh, Recycling Lives, and uh, we learned and saw uh, this uh, recycling center that we would like to set up here in Lilongwe is actually um, a thing that we saw in Lancaster. And um, we also would like to use part of the money that we're going to get uh, through funding. Um, would like to invest a lot in, in technology. So we'd like to uh, build an app where we're going to connect our, <coughs> our clients and um, they'll be paying digitally, but also um, uh, the corporate clients as well. Um, we have a group of women um, so that when West comes to, the, uh, to our, uh, what we call hotspots, um, we recycle right there. And so we're also uh, doing some organic farming and uh, we are producing different, you know, vegetables, and uh, we are selling the same. So um, the revenue that, that's coming from West Collection, from household plus um, corporate clients, and uh, products that we are—I mean, vegetables that we are growing in those hotspots—is, um, I mean, amount to about three thousand pounds. So uh, we would like to get about uh, eighty thousand pounds, which we're going to invest in that. Congratulations, Stephen! Sure. That's a great business, and uh, I love waste. Uh, collection businesses uh, because it will always be around uh, regardless of the economy. Uh, we go through trash. In fact, sometimes during downturns, we go through more trash. Um, so I think that's very valuable. Uh, what is the breakdown of resident your business versus residential versus commercial? Like, uh, are you 80% residential, 20% commercial? or? Well, so... Um... We, ha uh, we have a uh, 30% business, corporate clients, and 70% uh, residential. Okay, and about how many clients total do you have? Uh, that, um, do you mean both uh, corporate and uh, residential? Yes, sir. So, okay, so for residential we have, uh, we, currently we have uh, one, uh, 180 in Lilongwe only. And um, corporate clients, we have uh, we have three. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so up next, uh, we have Robson. Thanks, Stephen, for such a clear, clear, clear um, rundown of your business and 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 the performance. Robson. Okay, so Robson is with me, and so he's coming. Okay. Hello, good evening. Good I'm Lapson Sanfria, Managing Director of Innovant Food Gardens. Currently, we are in farming, trading, and processing. And also part of it, we do extension. We train women in mushroom farming and organic farming. So basically, we are looking for um, expanding in a processing after doing farming and trading. So that's it. Our uh, annual revenue is uh, close to 9,000 pounds. Hello? 
Hello? Yes. Yeah. So we are also planning to start processing on mushroom to do viral addition processing. How much are you looking for investment? And uh, how much money will you be, able, how much revenue will that investment produce? The, uh, the additional investment, invest, investment projection is uh, around 23,000 pounds. And that money, if we properly utilized, I'm projecting to gain close to uh, 20,000 pounds as well. That is annual turnover. Okay. Yeah. And I can, uh, do you have any questions? No, I'm good with that. Thank you so much. That was very clear. Thank you, um, Rapson. Um, we move on. To, yeah, thank you. Caroline? Marcy, Marcy, go next. Merci. 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 Um, so my um, um, Massive, there is some noise in the background. Do you have your TV on or something? Oh, I'm A lot of noise in the background. Um, no, I can I, I can't hear you myself. Huh? Ah, there you go. Very That's good. Better. That's okay. Now it's working. Excellent. Excellent. Carry on. Okay, so um, it's going to be a business idea whereby I want to have a business to come before I produce and manufacture cancer oil. So, that's what I want to do um, is to have, uh, to have maybe five take of land whereby we plant plant this day. And after it takes about a year for pasta to develop. So in within while we're waiting for the plant to mature, we start making pasta oil, thinking of buying um producing plants to make uh this is vegetable oil. So we're making vegetable oil from soya. So we buy from farmers, and then after we have the pasta to mature. We produce in pasture oil. So there's so many benefits to pasture oil, and there's not a lot of African countries or in Malawi in general, they're not supplying pasture oil anywhere else. So we want to produce as well as supply because most of our sisters in Malawi they are importing pasture oil. And the, we, I want us. As a Malawi to go beyond Malawi. I want to produce and supply to other countries and have Malawi as one of the master oil producing countries. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Masi. Um, next, we have Chikondi. 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 
Okay, so I guess we go to the, the next list. Precious, are you ready? Precious, are you yes, ready? Yes, I am. Super. Hello. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Hello. Go well, ahead, Chikondi is back on. Can you hear me? That's Chikondi. Okay. Good evening. Good okay, evening. I'll just I'll just hold. Sure. Good evening. Hello. Hello, Chikondi. Yeah. Carry on, please. All right. Uh, I'm Chikondi. Um, I am into uh, piggery, pig farming, um, which I started in a rather funny way uh, six months ago. Uh, I had a small garden where I was doing vegetables, and the guy who was overlooking my, uh, my vegetable garden had pigs. And he wanted to send his children to school and had no cash. And he's like, Madam, can you please buy my small pigs so that I can send my children to school? I was like, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> Long story short, I, 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 I ended up buying his pigs and learning from him. But then when I started researching, I find that it's something very big and something that I can do um, like professionally, not the way he told me. So uh, this May, I started constructing collars, crows, so that I can expand what I started. So basically, I'm looking to, uh, one of the days as I was in the village, the guys tell me that at the trading center, each and every day, they slot a pig. And there are times that the uh, people selling the pig um, uh, meat on the, in the trading center, they have to go into the villages looking for pigs. So I was like, wow, this is one of the ready markets that I can have. So that's how the dream came about uh, six months ago. And right now I, I, I've started uh, modding bricks for the farm. And when I came across TW, I felt like I can join in to uh, uh, boost my enterprise. So as of now, I'm looking for around 19,500 US uh, dollars to help me in the construction, buying animals, buying feed, running it at least up into a year where I can start getting um, profits. So yeah, that's where I am as of now. Thank you so much, Ekondi. Very precise and, and, and brief. Uh, Roland, uh, Steve? No, uh, I think it's, uh, yes. it's, it's quite clear, except that uh, you, you, have you identified uh, who is your target market? I mean, my is, target is, is pork popular in Malawi? Yeah, my, my, I, uh, during my research, you know, researching on the net and stuff, uh, lots of people, um, 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 the, the urban is uh, developing. Most people are moving into the urban and food is one of the best, it is one of the things that is uh, an in thing because, you know, we have to feed the population coming into the cities. So as I was saying that uh, during my small research, you could find that even in the, uh, like in the villages, it's still something that people buy daily. So that's my first target market from the village where I'm, 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 I'm currently doing it small. But obviously, I'll also go into town where I can sell in the shops, in the townships, because even in the townships, people are selling, you know, pork every day, you know, small, 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 small enterprises. But you find that four or five people, each one has slaughtered a pig and they, you know, they are selling. So that's my, my target market. Okay. Uh, question. Yes. Uh, how many pigs do you have right now? Right now, I've got ten. Ten. And do you, have, got, yes. do you have a plan for a breeding program in addition to buying more, but also breeding? Uh, um, as I'm saying that this was just six months and I keep learning, the, the, um, the person that is help the professional that is helping me in the, um, uh, I've engaged a professional to help me in the, the whole thing. And he even talked of breeding. So it's something that is developing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Something that I'm learning, something that is developing. And he even talked of the breeding thing. So it's like, you know, I'm actually building something that's, but that's in the plan. Oh, I, ha I have no doubt that if it's a good business move, you're going to be on top of it. I can tell. Uh, qu uh, the other question I have, what's yes. going to make your pork, what makes your pigs different from all the other small piggeries? Uh, during my research, uh, why should they buy your pigs? They should buy mine because, as I'm saying that I'm still researching, 
uh, I have to feed them the proper feed. One of the things that I found out during my research was that people are doing shortcuts in the feeding. You know, they're just giving them maize bran. But as I said, that there's a person that I'm consulting that is in the agricultural industry. He, he advised me to do the right thing when it comes to feeding. And if you do the right thing, obviously I'm going to, you know, be at par with the others. If you were given $19.5,000 mm -hmm. USD, how many pigs will you have? How many pigs am I going to have? Yes, if you receive the funding. Um, as I'm saying that uh, I'm consulting, um, I'm consulting uh, a guy who is in the agriculture. Right now, he just did the, um, the layout on the farm. He, he visited the place. I've got 15 acres of land. He came and visited the place and asked me what I'm going to put on the farm. And the contract with him, we're going to go even into that, where he's going to advise me on how we can do it as a business. So Very it's like, good. as I said, I'm developing. But that's obviously, we'll look into it so that he can plan on how many, how many uh, animals are going to keep. So the uh, funds that I'm, I'm looking for are going into construction, buying the animals, you know, feeding, vaccinations, all that, construction of the farm. Yes, very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shikandi. Thank Welcome. You. Welcome. Okay. Shikandi. Yes. Uh, very exciting. When we listen to you, we, we bubble with the energy and the passion that you have, even for this. That nice. This is coming Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. And, and uh, just for all the entrepreneurs on the call, you know, there has to be this um, passion that, that you have for the, the idea you're, you're, you're presenting and, and the business that you're building and, and, you know, and the project that you're running. You know, yes. people, people, people invest. Investors invest in relationship and in people and in that yes. connection. I want to know that you're passionate enough to stick out your own business, that you will be able to go the whole way. You know, even if it's, it's learning and risky, they can see that you have what it takes to stick it out, you know? Okay, and, and, all right. And so I, I, I joined Dr. Roland in saying that, you know, we have no doubt that when you get your feet, you'll, you'll get along there. I'm but, sorry. Uh, what I'd like, yeah, what I'd like to encourage you is between now and your next submission for the 10th of July, make okay. sure you're able to answer those questions. What are you doing with the money? The money, okay? yes. Okay. Yeah. How much is going into construction? How many animals will you have? All what right. is the size of the and how will that, you know, how soon will it begin, you know, to pay back the money? How pay soon do you okay. to make the revenue, okay? Be able right. to think about that very carefully because these are answers you'll need to have at your fingertip in August. Yeah. Okay? I'm going to look into that definitely. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. You. Yeah, yeah. So um, after Chikondi, we now come to Precious. Precious, you are ready? Yes, I am. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So my name is Precious, and um, my, business, my business is in the textile industry. I started sewing when I was very little. My mom used to like sewing. And so it's a passion I have grown over the years. I started with one sewing machine. And then later on, I opened a shop where I do my tailoring. I shared, I shared with a friend. And so... The business has been able to grow and uh, been able to procure a, an industrial machine. So the business plan that I have shared with, with the, the, the business investment I'm looking for is for growth into actual production of fabric. So being a new mother, I realized that most of the products that, like most of the clothes that we buy are imported. So when it comes to local made items, it's very hard for them, for us to find you either have to get a tailor-made or you can't really find something that is re ready to wear in most stores. So my dream was to create a ready to make wear um, line for toddlers and then also produce textile, produce uh, fabric. Because at the moment, most of the fabric, uh, the actual, the, the main fabric company that is available is in Blanche. It's uh, David Whitehead and Sons. And they, they, they produce in large quantities and there's not a lot of people who can actually afford it. So the ones that are actually able to afford have to put in money together. And what I'm looking for is to have a production site. So I have land available that I want to have a production site for local fabric. And then this local fabric is going to be able to cater into the community for all the other people who want 
specifically cultural or artistic type of fabric that says this is us because a lot of fabric that we're using nowadays comes from different countries i think as a country we don't really have a dna we don't really have a we don't have what says this is us most of the fabric that is made locally is usually um to do with maybe a particular season a particular um say um if if, if there's maybe i don't know how to explain this say church related i would say maybe church related fabric or a large organization that's just going to produce fabric but there is not a lot of artistic fabric except the ones that are massively produced i think by david whitehead so even smaller artists do not have an exit to produce fabric that says this is us so there is that part that i want to cater for and then also the ready to wear product and the ready to wear couture for toddlers in from rompers to even proper little dresses and little suits for boys and girls. Um, the investment I'm, I'm looking for is uh, 20 million kwata. I haven't converted that into dollars yet. 20 million kwata. And this is going to cater for the installation of the plant itself. So the plant and then an inclusion and addition of three sewing machines and to be able to have about three more tailors uh, at the point of uh, production, because at the moment we have one industrial sewing machine and then to also get an overlock machine. At the moment, I have to get my stuff overlocked elsewhere because otherwise the, when you just sew stuff and it's not overlocked, it doesn't look as neat. So I have to take my finished product and then go somewhere else to get it overlocked, which becomes it's quite costly. And at the end of the day, what I end up making. So on a monthly basis, my my revenue comes up to about 250 to 300, depending on the month that is there. And so when you divide that over making sure there's all these other costs, it's a passion that has been driving it so far, but I'd like it to grow. But I'd like it to grow. Please take that. But I'd like it to grow to such a, I'm sorry about that. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. So I'd like it to grow that it caters for a larger number of people and that most times we have a lot of um, orders that have to be turned back because we can't simply be able to take on the amount of work that is there. So if I was able to increase the number of tailors that I have on hand, because besides myself, I have one other person and then actually have, um, actually have fabric that is being produced at the site. So sourcing of the cotton will have to be locally because that's also another industry that I'd like to support the agriculture sector because I think we really need to build we need to build we need to build connectivity in our businesses where we're not just importing stuff but we also need to get things locally and then process them into finished products which I think has been a, a very large gap in our country for the longest time and so my passion is to at least make a contribution to one of the end um, and products that are being produced locally and just contribute to the culture of saying this is who we are and this is what we stand for so for me i think my, my passion is really creating a brand that says from malawi <laughs> in a nutshell i think that is what our business is thank you uh, i have a couple of questions uh, as it relates to this uh how much did you say you're doing in revenue per month you said 300 but yes 250 to 300 thousand okay and um quota right yeah. yeah yeah okay so yeah so minus rentals and then you pay somebody it comes down to about 150 on a month which is uh minus expenses right right so about 50 percent margin very good uh you know i will just say this the thing that I have heard from you that out of all of the countries that we have heard, you said something that I have not heard another entrepreneur say, and it is something that the best entrepreneurs in the world innately have, and you can't manufacture it. Uh, you can't just think of what to say and then include it. It's just, it just is with you. And you said that, you your desire um is to have that there's a fabric 
with the with Malawi DNA in it uh, that that you just you wanted uh, you know that was a vision that you see, um, and that reminds me you know Bill Gates, uh, who was the founder of Microsoft, uh, so like of Excel and Microsoft Word uh, and or PowerPoint. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, his vision early on was to see a computer in every home. That was his vision. Now you have to understand there was only one or two computers in the whole world and it was in the United States government and you know and it was the size of a whole house and uh, it was sending people to the moon <laughs> you know so to think like well a, like a you can't have a computer the size of a house inside of someone's house that costs tens of millions of dollars but he had vision and uh, and he saw uh, you know now we not only have a computer in our homes most people around the world have a computer in their pocket with a smartphone, smart. right? Yeah. So, and it's more powerful than the computer that sent people to the moon. So hold on to that vision of uh, having a fabric that is infused with the DNA of Malawi, um, because the rest of the world, we don't know what that means. We don't, you know what that Malawi DNA is. You know what it looks like. You know what it feels like because you painted a word picture for us but we don't have a tangible representation of that. And so uh, continue, even though you're doing the other services, which you should do, uh, keep that as the ultimate just vision uh, because it will guide you on your, on your actual business steps. So congratulations you. on, on your business, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Precious, I think uh, you've got a wonderful idea there. And, and I like the fact that you're also looking at supporting uh, the local Malawian farmer by using cotton into your production. And that is, that is quite commendable. You know, for, for me, this type of business really, what makes it successful is how you brand it. Yeah, because textile, I mean, a, a lot of people normally like to have, uh, they, they like convenience, yeah? So they'll go not necessarily for brands, but they want something that is cheaper, they can import. But if you have a brand that sticks out and it has got some identity, yeah, that can be the differentiator uh, for, for your business. So I think a strong brand in the textile industry is extremely important. And I think you seem to, 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 to be getting it right here. So well done. Thank you. Yeah, very well done, um, uh, Precious. And um, I just love the made in, made in Malawi, the DNA, the DNA, giving me that identity. You know, so keep going, go for it, go for it. Um, next, we have Bashir. Yeah. Bashir. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Bashir. Yeah. Carry on. Yes, Bashir. Carry on. Okay, I'm Bashir Gamwendo, uh, a co founder of MBIOS. It's a, an agri, agri business partnership type of business. So, we are into machine production. So we are at, uh, we have just started the uh, like some four to three to four months ago. Uh, since we have started, uh, we 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 have uh, we we have, we have a, a revenue of uh, of about eight 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 dollars per month after all after all deductions after all expenses. Uh, so th these mushrooms are uh, we. we these mushrooms we, we sell them through our lo local households so our aim is to our, our aim is to to distribute ma our mushroom to to shop uh to sh shop light and and other and other supermarkets throughout, throughout the country uh so in in, in our proposal uh we are seeking fund uh funding of of about 20,000 20, US dollars. Uh, we want, want to use this fund uh, to increase our business by building, uh, by, by building more mushroom houses, uh, to, to build a, a, a laboratory. With this laboratory, we will be, we will be producing a mushroom spawn or, 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 or mushroom seeds uh, so, so that we, we 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 can use this this seed to 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 
to produce our own mushroom and then this will be sold to uh, to different farmers. Uh, also, this fund will, will be will be used will be used to in marketing and dis, and distribution of of our mushroom through, throughout throughout the country. Uh, uh, on, uh, to add on, uh, on on the laboratory, we want this laboratory to to be to be a, to be a, a research hub where we will, will be will be providing consultancy services to different youths and to uh, to teach them on how to produce to produce a mushroom and also uh, with this research we want to domesticate uh, the wild mushrooms. Uh, in, into uh, in, in, into into mushrooms that that uh, a, a farmer can into a, 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 where a, a farmer can where a, a farmer can, can produce uh, locally rather than rather than waiting for rainy seasons where where mushrooms uh, just grow on, on their own. So uh, after after. After uh, after we, we will be successful to to have this funding, uh, we are we are projecting that we we can we can have we can have a, a revenue a revenue after all deductions per month of about one thousand uh, US dollars per, per month after after deductions. Yeah. So apart from that, uh, and uh, we would like to go into tissue culture. Uh, it is, is where we want to, to produce uh, planets with, with the free diseases. Uh, we, want, we want to, to here in Malawi, uh, we, we, have, we have a problem of banana bunch of uh, virus disease. It's a, it's a disease which has a, wiped a lot of bananas here in Malawi. So we, uh, with, our, uh, with our expertise uh, in the, in in, in 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 plant production, we want to 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 build a, a laboratory uh, to to build at least three greenhouses where we will have we will have uh, we will have to to produce these bananas with with the, with the free viruses and to distribute to farmers and the government and government and government organization where where these these organizations will will distribute to farmers. So here in, in, in tissue culture business, uh, we, we are seeking fa funding of, of, of about 50,000 US dollars. So as I, as, I have, as I have said, this fund will, will be used to, to construct a tissue culture laboratory, uh, to construct uh, at least three, to construct at least three greenhouses where and the, and the, and the, and to buy a van where with this van will be used to, to distribute these uh, clean, clean uh, banana plantlets. So that's that's uh, we we are, we are expecting to to have to have a, a revenue month of of about two thousand five hundred a. Two thousand five hundred US dollars in 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 tissue culture. Uh, so that's that's how about about our our businesses. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Bashir. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, that's very clear. Bashir, I would say one thing before you leave. You ought to consider, you know. What if you only were given ten thousand dollars USD, not fifty thousand dollars, and only built one greenhouse, not three greenhouses? What could you do? You know, have a, another alternative as well, um, because once again, the concern can be that you have more product than you have demand when you grow too fast, and if you're tripling or quadrupling, if the demand isn't already there, then it, and, and here's the other thing. You can get an investor to give you ten or fifteen thousand dollars to build one greenhouse and get transportation and a delivery, and then uh, they can say once you're done building that one and it's at capacity, we'll build another one 
and continue on a relationship with you? Uh, that, that, that can be a, a good idea uh, to, 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 to start, to start a, a small, but we, we are projecting that apart from, uh, apart from producing uh, bananas, we can, we can be doing uh, other, other plants like sweet potato, where the government is advocating in, in, in farmers to produce uh, bananas which, which, are, which have uh, orange, orange fresh, which, have a, which has a lot of, which has a lot of vitamin A. So by building at least two, two greenhouses or three greenhouses can, 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 be, can much be better rather than building one, one, one greenhouse uh, and the mixing, mixing plants, uh, I think it cannot, it cannot be good. But also, if there's an alternative that we, we have less uh, funding, we can, we can, we can be, we, we can start with, 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 with one, one plant. Yes, yes, that's a good idea. I like both sides of that. You made a good argument yeah. for why you need all three, or uh, and that it doesn't work uh, to uh, to put all of them in one. Or if you have to start with one, then you only start with one plant or one crop. Um, but the other thing that you mentioned that I want to address is you said the government was advocating, you know, to grow the fresh oranges. And I must say, I love fresh oranges as well, and I hope to have a taste taste of yours one day when I'm there, maybe in August. But I can tell you. Uh, there's a difference between the government advocating for something and the government buying what you produce, <laughs> right? So they can, governments, governments all over the world advocate for all kinds of things, but it's not their money. Yeah. It, they're not going to go buy it. They don't believe in it enough to invest in it, right? I mean, they, they don't need to pay for that. So, uh, so just because the government there. Just because the government advocates for something, uh, don't immediately assume that that means it's uh, a profitable business. It may take time and capital, um, and maybe that's for someone who's more established uh, with greater revenues who can make a long-term investment. Um, and I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm just saying as you as you process that, there's just recognize the difference between government advocating and government buying. Yes, yes, yes. Very good, thank you. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I like all the different mm. examples that are coming out because then all, all of us are learning. You know, think about your project, think about who are the stakeholders, think about is your market real or imaginary? You know, is it something that you're assuming exists or does it actually exist? You know? Yeah, so thank you so much for that, Bashir. Um, next we have Kelvin. Michelle, did you want to say something? I see your mic is on. No, no, I, I, I agree with all of you um, that the market actually embracing the project product is more important. And I understand on tissue culture because there's very few processing plants, tissue culture processing in Africa. We have South Africa. In Kenya, we have one that was started a few years ago. We have in Egypt. So Bashir has the opportunity to to target his crops all across Africa because people, as far as Kenya uh, take uh, buy crops from buy seedlings that are uh, have passed through the tissue culture process in South Africa, so it, it's a great idea. However, he needs to elaborate if he has tested the market. Banana, you know, people use banana. They, they don't uproot the banana because it, it'll grow season on season and it'll produce its fruit. So, how many are willing to uproot their bananas, clear their farms, and plant his bananas, you know? So he just needs to be clear on that and what he said about the government and what Dr. Nolan said about the government is so true, very true. Yeah. Thank you, Yeah, good point, Michelle. Yeah, good point, good point. Yeah, so Project Honest, take note of all this feedback we're getting. This is a good stage. Thank God you didn't before the investors in August and be asked 
<laughs> after after investing, you know, in three 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 plants and three you know three production sets, you know, only to find that there is no market. You have time now to readjust that. So next up, we have Kelvin. Kelvin, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Hello, I'm um, Kelvin Mateo. I'm a marketer and an author, aspiring entrepreneur. So basically, my vision is that. Uh, we want to build uh, an alternative energy source that uh, chalk fabricates. Basically, in Malawi, about 87% of uh, the whole population of Malawi, they use charcoal or um, firewood for, for cooking and uh, as a source of energy. About 13% is in the whole population which is about only 2 million Malawians use electricity. So it means the majority of Malawians, they use uh, charcoal and firewood. But uh, upon looking into that, uh, our research uh, came up with the fact that um, they're destroying forests and uh, the ecosystem is not going as good because uh, of that, that notion that's there basically in Malawi. So we want to build charcoal briquettes and then we want to, Supply these briquettes to to, to to basically all them across the country, and uh, upon looking at the fact that uh, the original charcoal that people normally use is uh, contains smoke, carbon monoxide. Um, there's been cases of carbon carbon monoxide poisoning and uh, uh, a lot of cases of um, that smoke uh, depleting, like the ozone layer and all that expanding um, climate changes. So we want to. Uh, in, in car these charcoal briquettes because they're very they're very safe the, they do not contain any carbon so basically we're killing carbon monoxide poisoning we're looking at uh, smokeless charcoal which is not depleting the ozone layer and uh, we're providing something which will last uh, longer in terms of providing the energy that the average Malawian would use to cook their food for so we basically want to project that yeah that's basically my idea what, what are these briquettes made, made out of? Um, the charcoal briquettes are made out of uh, waste material. You can talk of uh, um, basically anything that can turn itself into carbon that you, you, you can cook. We're talking of uh, the waste material that people release on, on a daily basis, the plastics that people throw away, um, the waste that people throw away, we collect that. We'd, we'd have to collect that rather and then um, carbonize it and then add it with the chemicals that are there to remove the carbon you in the process of making the charcoal briquettes you you take off the carbon and then you safely dispose it into the environment so they're made of uh, anything that can turn into carbon i'm talking of um so um uh so dust um any, any type of waste, it can turn itself into charcoal briquettes. So uh, recycling the, the waste that people use into something that can actually form energy. Okay, I mean, that's, that's a good idea. I mean, recycling and then getting yeah. these energy efficient products. I think that is important. So, so how much are you looking for and what, what is the money gonna be used for? Um, we're looking for 30,000 pounds. Um, I have a friend here who is going to clarify more about how the financial stipulation is going to go about, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Carry on. Hello, I'm Kondan Butao. Uh, we are looking for 30,000 pounds, and this 30,000 pounds will take 20,000 pounds into the machinery and the initial setup. Uh, 5,000 pounds will go into administration and the remaining five thousand pounds will be for miscellaneous and as a reserves reserves for any emergency uh, we're expecting to be producing 60 bags 60 bags of 50 kgs and each bag will be selling at about 12 pounds and uh we'll be making about eighteen thousand seven hundred no eight thousand eighteen thousand pounds in a month. And uh, on our course, we have like 2,600 pounds into administration, production, 3,000 pounds, and about 1,000 pounds, we have put it as overheads. 
which is totaling 6,600 pounds. And uh, after deducting all these expenses from our living, we'll be making a profit of 12,000 pounds, of which 30% will be taxed and will be remaining with 8,500 pounds. On this 8,500 pounds, we'll be reinvesting the money because in the first year, we're focused to be selling to institutions because when we'll be selling to institutions, it's like we'll be providing to them in back whereby we'll be cutting the packaging cost, which is also high. But in the second year, that's when we'll expand more to households. Kelvin, uh, are you saying uh, that uh, if you receive 30,000 pounds investment, yeah. that you're going to be able to do basically 220,000 pounds in revenue yeah, that, per year? Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the projection that we had in our proposal. We're I, gonna... I'm hearing that, I'm hearing that, and that, I mean, it obviously catches my attention uh, because yeah, yes. it's a solid business. But yeah, it's I very also, solid because um, if you check at the population. Yes, let me ask though. Yeah. Because I, I, I know I, we ne none of us would have ever started anything if, the, if we didn't think that the projections would be great. Some of the unforeseen mm -hmm. things that I think are difficult on this uh, will be the trash collecting. And not only the collecting, but then the sifting through. In the United States, uh, landfills, uh, and I'm working with the Dominican Republic on this right now, they struggle separating all of the different types of debris into the kinds that they need or can recycle. And so the very few, after the expense of that, it makes, uh, it, makes it uh, very difficult to carry on. So wh how, uh, what, what, are you, what is your plan there? Okay, about from using different types of waste, uh, on the first phases, we are focused much on uh, wood waste, which is things like sawdust, and we have found our suppliers, which is, uh, we have a forest called Chikangawa. So we went there and found out the amount of sawdust that we can be collecting. Then, if it goes further, that's when we can go into other types of waste, waste materials. But for now, we are focused on wood waste, which is sawdust that is completely available. Um, aside from that, um, largely in Malawi, um, you spoke of America, but in Malawi, the, the practicality on the ground is that um, the the waste collected here, it, it actually gets, uh, it doesn't get refined per se. Um, they collect it together and they just, um, they have like special designated areas where they throw it at. So it's basically us just going back to recollect that waste and putting it much into more use. Okay. And I think what uh, Dr. Roland is alluding to also is your market, your yeah. market. Yeah. Okay. Um, our market, market drives uh, to that two hundred and twenty thousand. Where is that market? Okay. The market is, uh, it comes from um, all these institutions. We're looking at hotels, um, um, schools, uh, secondary schools, um, colleges, and all that. Um, aside from just having the 13% of Malawians using electricity, the electricity uh, practicality is a bit uh, expensive for them to, to use for cooking like uh, maybe four times or three times in a day. So if we supply that, uh, the charcoal briquettes to them, they'll, they'll be saving up from, from those costs and their businesses would even expand while ours is expanding so that we have a stable market from that. Aside from that, the, the average the residential Malawians they technically use um, charcoal, but we want to substitute it with this better charcoal, which is longer lasting. Um, it, it's, it's, it's smokeless and it, it, it's very legal on the, on the practical and international ground. And then how, does, how will your finished carbon product compare in pricing to charcoal if you are trying to displace the use of charcoal? Okay, uh, a standard bag of charcoal sells at about 6,000 and it weighs about 20 kgs. Our bag of charcoal will be selling about 12,000 kwaja, but it's, uh, it weighs about 50 kgs. The difference is our charcoal burns for about five hours, while the standard charcoal uh, about 30 minutes or 40 minutes. So it's like we have more bending hours and uh, lesser charge, which is making practically better than the standard charcoal. And the issue of smoke, 
most people complain about smoke when they are setting up their charcoal panels. And uh, to people who use electricity, in Malawi, uh, one kilowatt of electricity currently at a household late is about 7.2 pounds. So uh, a standard cooker consumes about 1,200 kilowatts per every hour, which makes it more expensive than the charcoal. So, uh, Kelvin, uh, you, you got some very, very nice projections there. And in fact, the numbers are very exciting. But so, so when, when you do your final proposal, just give a lot of thought to, to the, what's, what's likely to happen in future? Because that idea that you've got, I saw it uh, in Kenya some years back. People came up with that idea. In fact, they were, they were distributing through supermarkets. Yeah. But then eventually you found that, uh, the price of uh, gas, liquefied gas, became cheaper and cheaper. And people now, more, more households are using uh, liquefied gas, LPG, than either charcoal or electricity. So just, just project in terms of trends and see whether this product has got a life that can give a return. It could be exciting now, but for, for how long will it be competitive? It may be competitive now with charcoal. charcoal most likely it's much more expensive and not as efficient. How about other sources of energy? Like energy? Uh, that, some um, technically in Malawi, um, the average people that are able to purchase um, a gas burner or yeah, much, much of using gas energy, it's, it's a, 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 on the ground, it's very few. Because uh, the average uh, in Malawi, not, you spoke of Kenya, but in Malawi, it's about 20%, which is, 20% of the population, which is in um, in the urban areas between the three major cities here. So on the ground, it means that uh, the, those upon that 20% of the population, only those people who are able to to, to afford um, gas burners, because um, much of that that techno that uh, that energy being around, most of the people are not enrolling into it. So we projected for the next three to four years that um, people would have to enroll with our charcoal burners because it's been much of the culture in Malawi to use um, wood and charcoal. So we're just bringing out a better product of what the, the, the original people already use and we're putting it out there for them. Can I add on that? Uh, we know that uh, the raw materials might become scarcity after we will be producing in large quantities. So in the second year, we work with smallholder farmers. We make them have cooperatives where we teach them how to grow trees. We'll be growing our own trees. So just like for example, as of now, uh, it costs about 12 pounds to lease the one hectare of land in Malawi. So we'll be giving, we'll be going to farmers who have land, then we'll be teaching them how to plant trees which makes it way, way, way too cheap as our major input. So the more we make the input cheaper, the better we have the chances of competing with those things. Like the seedlings cost about 100,000 per hectare, plus the leasing, 112,000. Then we'll be buying them at about 500,000 kwacha. And that will be making us maybe six or seven million kwacha per hectare of land with that input of wood every hectare. And um, aside from that, um, you know, it's a business, so it has to expand. A brand has to expand by all means. That's what I believe in. So basically, if we projected for the next three years and we could make like 300,000 uh, pounds off of that, it means we can expand to bring in even the gas on our own. Or we could um, purchase some small brands to, to, to start manufacturing our own type of gas, aside from just this, because we're looking at energy production, not just um, being flexible to say we're only providing charcoal briquettes and we'll be constantly doing that for the next 10 years or so. No, a business has to expand. So we'd have to look at other options where we can have some twists and turns so that our business and our brand is there, because it's about the brand and it's about what we really focus on, the energy production. Okay. Take uh, right there because uh, we could. It's a very interesting business. Uh, obviously, it's pre-revenue. There are more questions, uh, but I think that I. The whole point is 
that you'll be able to present this to uh, to to me and the investor panel in August. Uh, we just want to make sure right. that uh, I hope this has been a good lesson as well for everyone else on the call. That uh, if if you have interested investors, they're going to keep pushing, uh, they're going to keep asking, and they're going to uh, be naturally inquisitive as to how certain if I invest in this, am, am I that I'm going to get my uh, return and get my money back? And so, especially when it's pre-revenue, they're going to follow those lines. And you gentlemen did superb. You, um, you, you gave me confidence, and I believe uh, Steve as well from his remarks. And so we commend you uh, and uh, thank you for sharing today. Uh, and I can turn it to you for the, for the next one. Thank you. No, this is absolutely uh, awesome. I mean, I'm sure everybody's being enriched on the call and this level of preparation is so important just to strengthen that final outcome. Um, thank you so much, Kelvin, and, and your team. Um, thank so you. is that Odala and Caswell with you? Kelvin? No. Um. Okay, so is Odala ready? Odala, are you ready? Caswell, are you ready? Caswell? I say I'm okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Steve, uh, thank you, Roland. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, it's a privilege to interact with you. I'm Kaso Nkanda. I'm a farmer. I'm doing shoebaking along the lake in Kota Kota. Now that uh, sugarcane estate, I'm able individually to cut for it through my salary because I also work as dean of a faculty at university. So the proposal that I conveyed your way is not necessarily about farming. I feel like I didn't need an investor in that area because I'm doing it at a small scale, yes, but also I'm able to manage it. But uh, so that is about the education sector um, and I'll be very honest to say that in that educational sector I'm coming in as a startup I've got about uh, 14 hectares of land their land there is no single structure there it's just 14 hectares of land along the lake uh, where we are planning to build a university there. So the proposal that I wrote, I was actually requesting for money uh, so that I get a loan to build structures on that um, uh, bare ground. Uh, just to give you a background how I know this is going to work, Malawi, we have a political background uh, which um, gives us uh, a platform that education happens to be within our culture. In Malawi, entrepreneurship is more or less like a new concept, but uh, what we used to know, you know, since the one-party system, and even when the multi-party system came, we all we knew was that you go to school and you are going to have a good life. The entrepreneurship uh, uh, concept is a little bit new in Malawi. And the reason why I'm saying is just to I uh, assure you that if you talk about education as a business in Malawi, you can talk less in terms of competition because whether you are poor, whether you are, you are rich, or what we know is at least you must get some education. So uh, I, I requested for uh, 600,000 US dollars, of which the 400,000 US dollars is for building structures. And the 200,000 is for uh, operations. Uh, within my projections, like at the university where I work, we are actually renting from the Chinese. Uh, we are only renting seven uh, rooms for classrooms. And then we have got um, about six rooms for administration. But I can assure you that we get uh, 400,000 Malawi kwacha for every student, and we have got over 3,000 student, students, I mean, and we make over a billion 
yeah, just from uh, seven rooms of classrooms, but also five rooms for offices. So this structure that I'm talking about, um, I said in proposal that there will be about like 18 classrooms, you know, management offices. So if you look at my projections in terms of profit, they may sound unrealistic, but they are realistic because I've got um, uh, a hands-on uh, experience, but also um, I, I'm like a witness because I'm working within a university, university setting which has no structures. We are renting. We only uh, use about seven classrooms, but I think some of my colleagues, even who are on this chat, they know Pentecostal Life University is one of the leading private universities in Malawi. A lot of money. So because I've been in that setting for a long time, I know how the, uh, the education business works, and I've got their land. So then I'm saying, what if we build structures uh, in this land? In Malawi, we only have maybe about five public universities and the extra seven private universities. But I'll give you an example. Say annually, if some people, if, if high school students sit for their exams, they can be 30,000. Now, be less assured that maybe out of the 30,000, only seven, only like 7,000 will be admitted to the uh, public universities, they, the rest uh, go to private universities. So here in Malawi, the competition is very less. All you need are structures. You just need structures. If you are able to take 3,000 students, it's not because it's 3,000 who can afford, but it's because your structures can only take 1,000. So lastly, um, I am really looking forward to uh, accessing a loan that I can do to build structures on this ground. Looking at my mission, we are targeting to have maybe about three to 5,000 students. In our we normally have two students up a year. We will be giving 2.5 billion, which is in Malawi. If we take it in the US dollars, it will be 2.5. 2.5 million every five, uh, five months, uh, 2.8 million every five months. So I would say uh, maybe annually we will be Yeah, we lost Caswell. Uh, but just for the video and, and for uh, his feedback later, uh, my initial thoughts is education, uh, starting a university is a very difficult task. Uh, it is more than just throwing up a building and being able to house uh, it, uh, you know, you have to have curriculum that is that is uh, unique. Uh, your professors that are unique, uh, that have uh, you know credentials and well known. You have to get accreditation. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that come before the building when it comes to starting a university, a private university. Uh, the other uh, challenge I would want to see him overcome in August is. Um, is how these three to 5,000 students, and that's a big difference, by the way, between 3,000 or 5,000, but uh, uh, how they will fund the private university expense uh, by, if they're not going to a public. And, uh, and, and the way other places do it around the world, you know, they're taking out loans to go to college or what have you, which is, I don't actually advise in most cases. Um, so uh, I, I prefer like a technical or trade school um, for that. But uh, uh, so how would he help these students afford private university uh, if there's not government or institutional funding for such? So those are just a few uh, thoughts uh, for Co Caswell. Nikon? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, um, you can yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Starting a university as a, it's not it's not easy. I've been involved in setting up a university. I don't know about the regulations in Malawi, but in Kenya, it takes at least four years before you can get a license to, to, to do a university because of the requirements. So it looks like a pretty long-term project. And even more important is in terms of the curriculum also, because uh, that has to be approved by the authorities. So it is, it is a good idea. But as a business, I think maybe the payback period may be a little bit longer. And the initial investment in terms of resources may be a little high, a lot more high than what you're asking for here. 
$600,000 to put up structures, do the curriculum, get licensing and get personnel. It's, it's, I think it's stretching it. It may not quite be enough. So we need just to go back and look at the idea and just polish it up. Yeah, Steve, I totally concur with you. I mean, I know what it takes uh, uh, to, to do that in Kenya. Um, we don't know about the, the, the landscape of, uh, of Malawi. Nasreen, maybe you could speak to that because you're in education and uh, you understand the context of Malawi. But just before Nasreen speaks, I would then recommend that um, he can take his idea in phases, maybe start up a, an institute, you know, a learning institute or a tra training school, you know, and then, you know, build the experience, the content, the curriculums and all that, and then upgrade it into a university at some point, you know, you could stagger that, um, you know, in, in that approach. But Nasreen, maybe you could give insight on, on, on the yeah. landscape of Malawi. Yeah, Nyakan, I can't really speak too much on how the universities work, but I think your idea mm -hmm. and your approach is actually one that would work um, uh, towards building that that dream that uh, the dream that he has. Um, uh, I think everybody has given good feedback where um, he has to go, and he has to let tell us what the curriculum, what curriculum is going to be using the licensing, how it works, and then um, uh, how long will it take for the licensing to come out and uh, which curriculum is going to use and the period of week of, uh, uh, it will take to get all these things. And uh, also to go and polish yeah. up on the amount of uh, money that will be required because it will be a lot of material and a lot of online and a lot of things that have to go into university. Yeah, so I agree with you, Nyakan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve, I also agree with you. Thank you. No, you, you're welcome. Um, perhaps you'll give um, him that feedback and some of the suggestions, yes, I will. and I know, yeah, and I know he he'll also be able to have access and watch, uh, you know, the video and the recording after. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thank much. you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Karen and Osla, are you ready? Oh, okay. Now I'm ready. Karen Osla, Medson, are you ready? Medson? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm ready. This is Gabriel Medson. Yeah, go ahead, Medson. Um, as I've said, my name is Gabriel Medson Kamanga. I own Metima Academy together with my wife. Uh, meanwhile, we call it as a family business uh, in Ilongwe. We have uh, set up this business for five years to build the structures. Uh, we have started with the uh, nursery and the primary school. Our vision is very big and we are very uh, optimistic that God will take us through more so that with this potential investment that would come across if we are successful, we want to take education path through to university, but in stages. Uh, what we have noted so far in Malawi, the quality of education is going down, but the demand, as I heard from my brother Caswell, is, is really high there. So we are bringing in uniqueness in the sense that we should bring in uh, quality uh, education, starting from the grassroots. Uh, we are taking the uh, uh, values that is, because we believe as a family that education starts all started with God. So we want to link up our learners to know that they should know uh, they are predestined purpose. <coughs> Where they are good in, what they can do better, 
uh, and the school comes in to, to help such learners, we believe that they can be good citizens uh, that can bring an impact, not only to Malawi, but wherever they can go and work. Um, more so to see that, as Kazu said, we also believe in that, that school is not just there at, at the end of the day you go for employment. No, we should do, uh, challenge them. That's our aim so that they can also become entrepreneurs as we're seeing here. People that can help also into employing others in future. So uh, to cut the uh, story short, as we've said, five years building this, I'm working as an insurer. My wife is an educationist, a trained teacher. Uh, so from the resources that we're getting monthly, and a few, like in my case, a, a structure that uh, is meeting, I've not valued it, apart from the legal documents that we have with the government of the land, whatever, we believe it's more than 300 million Malay kwacha for the structures. But then we need to build uh, buildings for, for the Nazareth. Uh, we have spared one block. We have four blocks uh, with the two, two classes each, which is eight. So this school is from standard one up to seven. Seven class, Elena has to sit for primary school living, such a structure for the nursery. And then our aim is to make sure that we take these learners from nursery, let's say, majority of them through to university. So what we are trying to say is, if we can have this investment, to start building a secondary school as well. Well, this school, maximum, uh, not less than 420 learners. Meanwhile, it is, we just opened the doors last year, that was September. So we have, currently we have got 53 learners. Um, now with the COVID, yeah, we, we, we just expect as the government is promising that on the 30th of July we open, we have made some door-to-door -door advice. People, when they come, they are convinced with the structure. I remember one of the le senior lecturers from university, they wanted to rent it so that, I mean, they wanted the premises, we should rent them so that they should be using it as a university. We said, no, our vision is big because people cannot believe that is a, a primary school. Why? As I've said, we, wa we want to have uniqueness in quality, in terms of quality premises, as well as uh, qualified teachers. That should bring in the vision that we have in quality education. So uh, because of we are talking about some structures and then starting also a similar school so that those that will sit for uh, standard seven going to similar school, we should carry on some of them to similar school. So we are looking for 2.5 million US dollars. Why? The similar school we are looking at is a girls secondary school, boarding one. We want to start with girls. We want to promote girls in Malawi most uh, people, you know, there is that tradition that uh, girls know, but we can train uh, boys. So we want to start with girls to have a boarding segment with the, all the structures, teachers, houses there, and also increase on the orphans, because on the primary school, we already have 10 supporting other family with this newly uh, introduced school. We want to carry on that even number of uh, that we can see. So uh, I would say in brief that, that that's the the proposal we are putting with with estimates. I think we brought in there, but in, in total we we are saying if we can have 2.5, we can know we know this is a lot of money to say in terms of Malay budget because that's 1.6 billion. But when we look at the structures, we are saying it can be uh, in, in in chunks. We can get less as we, 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 we increase. I mean, we go on with the uh, with the building of the project. See. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, my son. Really, really glad you're here. So, um, who is this? Odala said she's he or she is back. Um, Odala, and then Karen and Oscar, you'll go next after Odala. Is that okay? Okay. Odala, are you ready? 
Okay, okay, thank you. I see Karen ready. Okay, so sorry, Karen. Karen, also you go. It seems Odala is. Thing. Good evening. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening. Yes, good evening. My name is Karen Kwani. I'm based in Lilongwe. Um, we have a beauty spa by the name Rosa Maria, located in Lilongwe. It's um, a year old. We started it uh, last year in um, June, uh, on, on the start of June. So, yeah, um, basically, we are. Um, uh, beauty uh, offer a friendly, relaxed, ex exclusive environment, uh, trendy, classy, stylish, sophisticated, refined treatments for all the beauty services. Yeah, so our business is to provide a beauty experience that one would come back to. So I work with sister, um, but our aim, our main aim is to go through. Um, we are heading to education sector um, to train the youth um, to be trained as beauticians. Um, and uh, so far, uh, and school leavers. Uh, so far, we are doing fine with the beauty school, but. Um, our main um, our main plan for the business is to raise capital to purchase the building that the spa is operating as for now. Uh, so if we have um, the 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 funding for the for the raising of capital because our our landlord has given all of us um, opportunity to buy the the shops. So if we buy the shops. Uh, for, for for from the landlord and then we we we, we divert it into um, education sector and have um, school leave us so that uh, we train them to become beauticians. So yeah, um, I think that's about it. I'll leave it. for the uh, accounting and uh, uh, good evening Karen has been explaining we want to go into the starting, um, technical beauty training school we have the experience of noticing that uh, our staff turnover in terms of professionalism has been very high because we have beauticians and, and hairdressers and people who have gone into the industry without training. So we've seen the gap that there is a need to train and there is a market for uh, the youth and the school leavers who are um, wanting to go into the practicals who maybe are not, don't have strength in academic sector. So that's what we want to go into education sector, um, the beauty industry in mind. I think it's a great industry. Uh, how much uh, revenue are you doing right now? Right now, we have about 160 revenue for the 2019, and with our operation. Say again, you have 167,000 in revenue from 2019? Yes. Okay. And how much uh, investment are you seeking? We're seeking for about 95,000 with the intention of purchasing a building which is going for 49 million. And then the balance which we would like to put into the uh, setting up of the beauty school and um, having the professional human resources to train quality students that um, have a professional uh, 
training and qualification into the beauty school and also reinvesting into the salon whereby we have a school and then we have a, a spa that is ready to take the interns from the beauty school and then they train and ready to go out there Hello. Yes, yes. Okay, very good. Hello. That, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that, that was helpful. Uh, the, my, my closing suggestion uh, to you would be to consider if the business can support the debt on the real estate. So if you're going to use a large portion of an investment to buy the building that you're in, um, the, instead of taking all of the investment in and paying for the building, <clears throat> that's generally not a good way to do it. Uh, you, it's better to get uh, a real estate loan and then only if the business can service the debt on that. Um, and so usually yes. business may want to, you may want the beauty school, you know, consider renting for one more year, even if you have to go somewhere else uh, and, and letting the cash keep building more students because that's a great business. You have a great business um, and you don't want to saddle it with real estate debt before you have to. Uh, that will help in the long run, but it's not uh, something to do in the first 12 to 24 months usually. Uh, but uh, because there's other things you can do with investment. I think you're very investment worthy and to look forward to uh, you going through the process and continuing you know, with the executive summary and, and the information Michelle will share shortly. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Roland. Yeah, thank you, Karen and Osla. Um, excellent. Um, Steve, did you want to speak into that or can we move to the next question? Uh, just similar comments to Roland, because uh, if you're getting a loan to put into, into brick and mortar, you better be getting a very good return from that brick and mortar. Uh, this sort of business is slow, the growth is slow, you know, getting in students, training them, the fees they pay, they may not be that high. So it's going to take a long, long, long time before you actually start making money for yourself. So, so it's, it's normally advisable. Look for an, a nice location, rent it, maybe get into a lease for five years, yeah? Yes. You know, and then keep paying the rentals. And any money that you, you borrow, use it for facilities that you need to generate the revenues. You know? If it's buying equipment, okay. for instance, you know, the sort of things, yeah. So, so think on those we were looking at reinvesting in the spa, but we were looking at also reinvesting into the spa and um, having more products there and having a brand which um, we, we do on our own. We are working on a brand that uh, natural uh, face brand, face um, brand for, for the skin and for hair that is man produced locally in Malawi, the Malawian palm oil that is available in Malawi. So we are working on, on such a brand and also reinvesting on the beauty spa that is currently running. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, you're on. Okay. You're so on. taking note, taking insight and strengthening, strengthening your submission. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Thank, Roland thank and, and, and Steve on that. Um, I think next we have Patsy. Patsy. Patsy, are you ready? And then Lamek to follow. Patse, are you ready? Yes, we are ready. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving good us evening. an opportunity. Yeah, thank you for giving us an opportunity to present our business proposal. I'm here with my husband, who is also my, uh, my business partner. So he's the one who's going to make the whole, a brief presentation of our business proposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again. My name is Bernard. Uh, our business proposal is about the garbage collection and farming. Uh, currently, we do garbage uh, collection uh, for both uh, corporate as well as residentials. So far, we have like 20% uh, corporate and 80% uh, residentials. And our revenue from uh, the garbage collection is that um, we we do like 
have uh, 1,176 um, dollars per month, which is almost uh, 14,107 uh, dollars per year. So our um, request is that uh, we want to, to ask for a loan of about 45,000 pounds. So the aim is to procure a recycling machine, which will be used to make manure, compost manure, which will replace a fertilizer, which will be used uh, for, for our farm. So through, hello. Yes. Carry on, carry on. Yeah. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, so through our farm, we, we already have our target, target markets, uh, which are cooking oil production company, uh, seed company, as well as animal feed production company. Uh, in our farm, we grow soya beans, as well as maize. And um, we expect actually like this year uh, to, to have um, a minimum of 25,000 kgs of soya beans which if we sell it at 500 pacha per kg will produce like uh, 12 million 500,000 Malawi pacha, uh, which is almost 14,705 uh, US dollars. That's our brief uh, proposal presentation. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I just want to... Thank you so much, uh, Patsy. Um, I just want to really quickly give a few more people a chance because I know that we, this meeting was to go until um, 8 p.m. Malawi, and you get it five minutes to 8 p.m. and we still have a number of you still not presented. So thank you, Patsy. We've taken note. Um, we just want to just give the rest like 30 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, you know, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Just say your name, what your company is doing, and, and, and how much money you're looking for. And then I'll quickly move on to, to, to Michelle so that you all can be able to capture what the next steps are, okay? Is that okay? Thank you so much. So um, very quickly, can we move to Lamek and, uh, and, and Fatma? Thank you very yeah. much, hello. Yes, hello. Please make it very brief so that you can give your other fellows a, a bit of a chance. Okay, go thank, ahead. Thank you very, thank you You're very welcome. much, madam. You're welcome. Uh, once again, thank you for giving me this platform to present my business proposal. Uh, mine is just a startup uh, business. It's about studio. Uh, Colas, it, it, it's called Colas Studios. Uh, which will include videography and cinematography, photography and graphic design. Uh, uh, we are looking for 25,000 US dollars. In fact, these funds will be used to purchase advanced equipment like cameras, uh, professional, uh, full, uh, professional HD cameras and other equipment concerning cinematography. So we have financial pro uh, projection on it. Uh, based on the research that I've, I've had in, in past few months, it shows that <clears throat> most of the photograph of photographers and video uh, videographers are freelancers. Normally we don't have a specific in the uh, area where we can register our art industry, but they are of course, places where we can go and just get a license where we, where we are and where we are operating from. So basically that's what we are looking for as Colat Studios. We're looking for 25,000 US dollars and that's include videography, cinematography, photography and graphic design. Thank you. Thank you, Lamek. Thank you for being brief and we appreciate your insights. Albert. And then Rose to follow. Ro Ro Rose to follow. Fatima is here. I'm with Fatima, so she can present us. Is that the same project or a different project? Different project. We're just using one laptop. A different project. Yes. Okay. 
Fatima, make it brief. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I'm Fatima. I am running a, a fabric uh, business. I sell fabric, local fabric. Basically, so far, I've been getting the fabric from uh, Zambia and Tanzania. So they are just the local fabrics, and I sell to the local Malawians. And my proposal is that I'm asking for funds to extend the market so that uh, we can get more of the fabric from many African countries and even outside Africa so that we can have a variety and extend the market not only to the locals, but also to some other people that we have. So my proposal is for um, 20,000 uh, US dollars. Thank you so much. I am done. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, and no, thank you, Rose. Um, thank you, Rose, for that. Abel? Fatima. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sorry, thank you, Fatima. <laughs> I'm already on, on, on Rose. Okay. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Albert. Okay, Albert, you're you're not you're not ready, Rose. Um, hello, everyone. Um, allow me to speak without the video because I'm having uh, internet challenges. Uh, my my name is Rose Nyambi. My business his name is Yana's Farm and Fruits, and. Um, um, our focus is on pottery and vegetables. On pottery, we're focusing on quails and uh, local breeds chickens. Currently, I started um, the quails um, this year and um, I have grown the quails so far. I started about two and a half months ago and I've grown them to uh, 700 plus. Um, and uh, my reason for asking for funding, which I'm asking for 20,000 uh, US dollars, is for me to expand from the quails to the chickens that I want to invest in. And um, the money is for building the, qu the quails for the chickens, as well as expanding on the cages for the quails. Um, currently, um, I, am I will start selling the quails this month on a monthly basis, but I intend to grow them in a period of three years to 3,000 in number. And for the chickens, I want to start with 500 birds and grow them to 1,000 in a year. Uh, so the money I'm asking for will go also into an incubation. Uh, which will assist me to be able to do the breeding on my own so that I can expand the number of birds. Um, in terms of projections, uh, in terms of revenue, um, when it comes to the chickens, uh, probably for a start at the beginning uh, with the 500 birds, a profit should be about 680,000 kwacha per month, which should be able to almost double uh, when I get to the thousand birds because I intend to be making my own feed. So from the money I will get by the end of the year, that is in January, I intend to purchase land where I want to build uh, the quails when I get the support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rose. I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, our teams, Michelle, Steve, um, Dr. Roland, have taken note of all those. And uh, we'll probably give comments at the end once all of you have spoken. So we'll just give a round of comments and highlights from where, you know, what, what we've picked out. So don't worry that we're not responding right now. And we'll they're just pick, you know, we're looking and they're doing excellent. Yeah. Yes. They're giving yeah. us what we need okay. concisely. It's greatly appreciated. Absolutely. So Abel, Thank are you, so you next? Thank you. You're welcome, Rose. You're welcome. Yes. Abel? Yes, Good. yes. yes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, 
I'll be very brief. But to begin with, I should appreciate um, your gesture because uh, my passion is financial inclusion. So the, the, the grants or the loans that are being uh, uh, to be put out is actually feeding into my passion already. Uh, I run a consultancy by the name of Center for Financial Inclusion and Literacy Consultancy. We do trainings, um, research, and marketing on uh, financial inclusion, financial literacy, and the financial consumer protection. In Malawi, we are actually, I would say we are the champions of financial inclusion because we use the local language, we use the sign language, and we also use the Braille um, version to communicate such to people. In fact, uh, our services would be of use to you also to realize the money that you extend to the applicants at the moment. Um, in our services, we have been training people, uh, uh, for instance, in terms of credit management, which has helped uh, financial institutions to recover their loans. Now, in that process, we saw a gap whereby uh, we give out trainings to people, but then they are also in need of, uh, of some money to, 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 to put into practice the knowledge that we have been giving. And when we saw that gap, we started with uh, a capital of 800,000, that is Malai Kwacha, as, uh, as loans. We, we, we started last year, and we realized all that uh, disbursement at a profit, of course, um, using our financial literacy approach as a means of uh, uh, promoting the payment, which in the absence of financial literacy, uh, most loans uh, end up to be bad loans. So uh, the, the, the proposal that I put uh, across is uh, we want to expand the lending. Um, as you know, um, financial sector is the most regretted one. And then we didn't want to venture into a fully fledged lending institution. So in phases, what we want to do is uh, to observe an, a, a project for three years, uh, lending, and then after that, with the experience and the customer base that we will have had by that time, we'll go into a fully fledged microfinance institution targeting the women, the youth, and the general population, especially even those in the rural. For your own information, in Malawi, it's actually 2% of the adult population which have uh, access to formal uh, financial services. And indeed, 34% uh, of, of the adult uh, population which have access, of course, to, uh, no, 26% which have access to the, the, the general financial services. I'm looking for uh, 10,000 pounds, which translates to uh, 10 Malawi kwacha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abel. That's clear. Um, who's going next? Winnie, then Natasha. And then I may have to pause at Natasha. And please, Winnie and Natasha, would you just um, give very brief, um, you know, intro? I want to have Michelle come and, and give the process because we have, you know, we've got to sort of wrap up the call a little bit soon after this, right? And then if we have a few minutes after Michelle has finished, then I can give the others a chance. We'll go ahead, Winnie and Natasha. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, so this is Winnie Meke, founder of uh, Structural Solutions Limited. Uh, we're here by forwarding a plan to start to, um, an industry, a, a cement-based block-making industry in Lilongwe. If you come to, to, to Malawi, Lilongwe, Lilongwe is one of the fastest building cities because of urban migration, and there's a lot of development going on. So there's a lot of building that is going on, and with the current provisional government ban of uh, <coughs> bent bricks, there's a, a switch to use of cement-based bricks. 
most people now are, dem are demanding the use of cement-based bricks um, in their buildings. But uh, in our research, we found that, yes, there are some small companies who are doing this, but it's, it's about their capacity and the durability of their products, um, which we want to make a difference. We want to have um, a big industry with uh, high-tech machines, um, which can make uh, several different uh, designs of blocks at one go. To have blocks, to have the interlocking blocks, to have the bricks, to have the um, the breeze, the breeze blocks, the window sills, to have a, a one-stop shop for all the cement-based products that people demand for. Because what is happening at the moment is you can go to one site just to buy the blocks. You go to one site to buy the interlocking bricks. You go to one site to buy another product of cement base. So we want to have uh, one place where we're going to provide all this to uh, private individuals, the construction industry, even the government, because at the, at the moment, even the government is championing the use of cement-based products. And most of the uh, building, in, building institutions are, are, use, are doing the same. So we thought venturing into this and providing uh, to have a capacity and the durability of the products that people want. That's is great. So, so we need, uh, how much are you asking for? Um, a capital of a capital of three hundred and ninety-five thousand uh, US dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And what will that be used for? This is going to be used for the buying of transportation delivery vehicles, the startup material, the machines, and also storage uh, like warehouses. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Natasha? Thank you. You're welcome. Natasha? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Natasha Nalikungwi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, carry on. Okay, my name is Natasha Nalikungwi, and I am one of the founders of Kutek. Um, I'll just be brief, as um, we have heard that um, we, we need to give other people a chance. So mainly, I am, my background is in ICT industry, I, um, and we own a company called Kutek. Uh, in Kutek, we have diversified in a number of um, components. One is hardware, local area networking, virtual networking, and as well as uh, software development. Um, the business was registered in 2012. We have had clients from the government sector, from the NGO sector, and um, from the private sector as well. Um, our annual return um, on average, it's uh, coming up to 20,000 to 50,000 uh, US dollars. And I think uh, last year, 2019, towards this year, that's when we, we actually may be uh, hitting towards the $50,000. Um, part of the business that we have actually come up with is to design an innovative ICT library in this library, we are trying to look at a number of things, um, which is the research center. And the research center will actually focus on data management. Right now, information is very vital. And Malawi being one of the countries that is just being developed, I think information is important, especially in the healthy sector, agriculture sector. and <coughs> So the research center will be built in a way that it will have some components for data collection, data analysis, and as well as reporting. 
our targets are NGOs that normally do a lot of um, uh, baseline surveys and they're looking for information. The healthy sector is also trying to look for information. And as well as people that are studying would also want to know more about certain components um, in, in information, especially in agriculture or healthy and um, education. Um, part of my um, um, career path, I have worked with the healthy sector. We have, we're doing a, a project under Baobab, whereby we are actually um, registering um, uh, people that are on ART. We normally, we don't call them <laughs> Uh, patients, we call them clients. So I found that it was very hard even for the government actually to come up with proper reporting structures so that they can actually report globally. So I have taken that initiative upon my heart to develop something on the healthy sector, which is part of the research center. Then on education, being Malawi, um, I've seen that also there are gaps in the education sector, especially from grassroots level. So we wanted to come up with a company that is called Ima Pumvilo running on a tablet, um, which can be sold at uh, not less than $20 and being a, uh, make sure that the curriculum is, the education curriculum is actually accessible to each and every um, uh, a pew pew from grassroots level. And uh, on another hand, we are also targeting the um, private sector. We want to come up with a data bank, a data bank whereby um, banks, insurance, company and any other business can come in and store their data for uh, backup or for um, safekeeping. So we're trying to come up with that. We've got land in Mangochi, which we, um, we, 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 I think it will be most ideal for the data bank where we are going to put all the infrastructure, the ICT infrastructure in there and come up with storage space so that it, most organizations can actually log in and dump their data in there, both physically and as well as on the cloud. Um, in Malawi, there are about 506 ICT companies from various um, sectors. Some are doing hardware, some are doing um, software development, some are doing just uh, uh, literal whereby they're just teaching people on, on IC, in ICT. But as for our business, we are trying to help as much um, and give back to the community and um, helping the economy of the country to grow. So already, we, I did a baseline survey uh, in the past two years, whereby I saw the viability, especially in the healthy and education sector. In the agriculture sector, we haven't done much because most of the data that um, agriculture is actually depending on is the soil analysis, which another component that this um, our country has not come up with. So we only deal with the meteorological center whereby um, farmers can actually come and access information about weather and also to overcome certain areas in disaster recovery. Um, it was, um, the last component that um, we are also trying to come up with is the M&D structure so that, that we are able to track down and trace each and every um, objective and project that we, we actually develop. Um, I'm looking at at least one million, um, I think here it is, is, it, it is in pounds. Um, one million pounds will help us to come up with proper infrastructure and as well as also to expand more on the... Um... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. So uh, one million pounds, I think it's, 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 it's enough for us to start up in terms of um, putting things together uh, in the ICT Innovative Lab. Mm. Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, I think I'll pause there for reactions from Dr. Roland and, and Steve, um, okay. you know, at this point. And then after that, I will pass um, the, the screen over to, to Michelle to take us through what we need to, to do to enhance and enrich and strengthen our submissions. Now, once Michelle finishes with her, her, pro, her you know, her presentation, I know there's eight mm -hmm. people who have not had a chance to speak. Um, mm -hmm. We'll look at time and look at opportunity and, and see if we can give them a chance to, to say something. So um, okay. Steve, um, reactions from those, um, or maybe I should start with Dr. Roland, uh, reactions from, from those enterprises that have just um, spoken. 
Yes, uh, there were several uh, very good ones. But, you know, what I really want to comment on is uh, the first two or three that went uh, were so succinct and articulate that I immediately want to uh, go to them afterwards and say, you know, please tell me more. Uh, what in, in preparing them to pitch in August, uh, everyone has to understand it's not how much you get out now. Um, it's kind of like dating. Um, if you, if, okay, boy meets girl. If boy asked girl to marry him and uh, kissed her right then and, you know, just like, let's go get married. It's like, whoa, I don't even know you. You don't, you know, try to get married on the first date. Um, and so you have a conversation and that might lead to another conversation. And that is the best analogy to get for entrepreneurs getting funding. You're, you're, you're dating you know, investors and you're getting to know one another. And if you come on too strong, then they're like, okay, um, you know, and then you have to know your numbers. And if you calmly articulate your, your business, then they receive it very well. And they also know because uh, they value their time. That's the biggest thing that investors care about is their time. So if somebody keeps talking, they don't, they're not even, uh, uh, kind. <laughs> they don't uh, just let you finish. They will cut you off. Um, they'll turn your microphone off. Yeah. They will hang up the phone on you. They won't let you just talk and talk. So you, if you have 30 seconds to say what you want to say, you can say, this is the business that I'm in. This is how much revenue I'm doing. This is how much I'm asking for. And I'd love to talk to you more about partnering with you. Boom. Half of the investors will go, I like you and I'd like to talk to you more and learn more. And then they'll start asking questions. So I think that's one of the greatest lessons because sometimes it has nothing to do with your business. It's can the investors hear you through all of the noise, through, through, you know, through a lot of talking. So uh, hopefully that uh, will, uh, will help you uh, when you do your presentations in August. Uh, but I am very impressed in terms of you know, my closing comments. Uh, I, I am very impressed uh, with the caliber of Malawi entrepreneurs. Uh, you blew me away, quite honestly. I'm, I'm surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised. I'm thrilled. I'm happy for you. I'm, I cannot wait to be there in August. And Nikon and I will be back again in February. And so we are just, I, I am thrilled to support you. You're on the right path. Uh, I think we keep polishing and working, uh, but you have heard some examples from entrepreneurs today that are doing it right. Uh, and presenting it right. And, uh, and so we're just very happy to support you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Dr. Roland, just uh, you know, to build on what you've said, I picked on one statement, you were pleasantly surprised, okay? Yeah. Because the reason why we do what we do, you know, having a great understanding of the African continent, the context of Africa and presenting it to the world stage is because there's so many things that go on in Africa, so in some little countries that people do not know about, you know, and they're very hidden. And we want to bring those countries to the, to the global stage because people like yourself find out that indeed there is treasure, there is value, there is, you know, brilliance and all these things. So, you know, just speaking on that, you were pleasantly surprised is really, really speaking to the global stage. I think that um, a, a lot of people on the global stage will be quite surprised that there is other countries doing great things with such great talent, you know, and such opportunities to invest. Thanks so much, Dr. Roland, for your insights. Thank you so much. And, and you know, your inputs throughout the, 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 this whole process has been quite, quite, quite valuable. Yeah, Steve, um, your comments? Okay, these are my wrapping up comments. Yes. I, I must say, you know, sitting for two, three hours listening to people is not, is not easy. In fact, when you told me that I'll be sitting from six to nine, I was like, I can't come. So yes. I must say, I must say, I mean, you guys have got really fresh ideas. I mean, really fresh ideas. And I think, is it, is it Abel? Is it Abel who came up with this idea of, you know, we are in the financial inclusion sector? Yeah. And the look value addition, you know, you're going beyond just making people literate to actually enabling them to actualize their vision, which to me is really a wonderful idea. And, and I really like that. Um, and there's a lot of focus in, in, in most of the proposals on agriculture. 
And it's, it's not a surprise because as I said earlier, it, it's, it's one of those areas that will always be relevant. Yeah, it'll always be competitive. Yeah. And for me, what is important is for you to understand, first of all, your, your market. Yeah. You need to understand your market and how do you differentiate yourself? There's a lot of agribusiness now taking place all over Africa. Yeah. But how do you differentiate yourself? Could there be a time where there's a, an oversupply of the product? So uh, as you do your final proposal, just think about differentiation, value addition, and as you move forward, how you're gonna deal with competition. And, and it's also important when you're looking at the long-term business to look at potential change in regulations, yeah, which could negatively or positively impact your business. Yeah. So you need to have a very clear understanding about what, what are the authorities thinking about this, but these various sectors. Yeah. And, and the sort of proposals or policies I'd like you to come up with, will they be beneficial to me or will they hurt my business? So you've got to have your ear on the ground in terms of what was the government thinking? What was the government thinking? Because I remember some years back, our government in Kenya opened up the economy. Yeah. So importing stuff was very easy. And that killed a lot of local manufacturers because they never anticipated that government could open up. And by opening up, it means of facing competition for maybe much more efficient economies. Mm. So what we decide to do now, instead of production, producing, manufacturing, they started importing. So, so as, as you polish up your presentations, give thought to local regulations, policies of the government, and ask yourself, how will this impact my business? And but, but, I mean, at the end of the day, really, I think you are, your ideas are very fresh. They're very nice. Focus a lot on the market and focus a lot also on the efficiencies that you're likely to, to bring into the market so that even if the other competitors, you're likely to come up with probably a, a better bottom line and therefore a better return to, your, to the potential uh, investors. And there is one or two people mentioned about organic, organic products, organic farming. Uh, this is one of those areas I'm seeing a lot of interest now in that particular area. And I know some, some economies they actually prefer importing foodstuffs from countries that are doing organic farming. So this is another area that probably you need to do a little bit more research and see, apart from just the local market, can my produce actually satisfy a demand probably in the UK, in a market where organ organic products are, are, are encouraged. Yeah, so that, that's really, you know, that's what I'd like to, to, to tell the, the participants. But otherwise, I think it, uh, it's great. The ideas are very fresh. Well done. Yeah. No, no. Th thank you so much, uh, Steve uh, Lugania. You know, look, you, you, Dr. Roland, Michelle, and others were on the call representing the mindset of, of you know, investors and the caliber of leaders who have been engaged. You know, time is really of, of an important resource. And to see that, you know, you found, uh, you know, while, while it looked like quite a long stretch to be on these calls, which it is, all of us putting our time is quite a sacrifice, but to see that there is value and all the great and rich ideas that we have had through and through. It's just amazing, you know, it's amazing. So as we wrap up, Steve, I'd love us to listen to, to Michelle and, and the guidelines she's giving, and then you'll give that just closing, final closing remarks as we, as we close off the call uh, at that point, okay? So Michelle, um, I'd love to welcome you right now. Remember that Michelle is representing, you know, the technical and advisory teams, the analysts that have been working on the submissions from all the six, countries that are on the tour and uh, she'll be giving a highlight of what they have observed so far some of their initial findings um, initial outcomes and 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 you know uh, some of the recommendations that they have for all of you for all of you so that you can go back and strengthen your, your proposals okay um, Michelle kindly kindly take the stage thank you Nyakan and I think Steve has done me justice by introducing what I want to say. You know, what I want to start with. What I want to say is that we are reviewing the, the proposals, the executive summaries from the inside out. From the inside out means from inside. Inside is your business. The business is, is the first thing we look at. So your business is your operations, management, your financials, your projections, your customer base. Yeah. That, that, that's the inside. Now, the, the immediate outside is the industry. Yeah, and he has mentioned, you need to have done your research on the industry you're venturing in. And if the government is pro your industry, because if they are not pro your industry, no matter what you do, you will somehow 
come across a few bumps here on the road. So you need to have researched on your industry and that's, that's also inclusive of the market, the, the customers, I mean, and the competition. Now, the other thing would be, the third thing we look at is the country. Now, the country again now is now the government, how they're embracing different things, the different uh, policies that are in that industry, you know, anything that the government does to affect the industry and that's affecting your business. So it's, it's three way. Now, uh, I had someone saying um, that, that, that they would like, they would partner with the government to, to, um, to market their goods. Uh, to be honest, you, you should have already gotten quotes from the government as we speak. You should be having an LPO, you should be having an order, you know, something that is tangible enough to show that they are actually willing to invest because su such things take a really long time. There's some people who want to start a school and if you haven't enrolled anyone yet, it's only practical that we would ask you in the first term, how many students are likely to enroll in your school? Okay, in the second term, in the third term, so if you say that in the, you have 50 students and you expect 400 students by the end of the year, I, I, you, you would have to really prove it, to prove that the projection, you know, from 50 to 400 is like 2000%. You would have to prove that increment in enrollment and how and why, you know, it, it, it would have to be realistic, a very realistic that we started with 50 and we grew with, you know, 10 more, 10 more each, each term, that, that, that makes sense, or 20, but if, if it doesn't just rise like that, even if you have all your other licenses and everything in order. So uh, that said, I will say just briefly on um, some of the Sorry, sorry about that. So there were different various industries and what we did is we, we tiered the, we categorized the summaries into three. Now into three was um, from the ones that are strong, the ones that are mediumly strong and the ones that require a lot of polishing and support to come up ready for the investor. So in those three categories, we colored them. So we colored them green, blue, and yellow. Green is a representative of go. I mean, green is, is the, the presentation was good to go. And, you know, everything was clear. And I'll give an example of, of one. So uh, someone is in ICT sector. They want $90,000 to acquire machinery. They're very clear on how they're gonna spend it. They're gonna buy vehicles. They're going to buy printing machinery and they've been operational for four years. They, there's a ready market. They can already show us that they have customers they're not able to supply to or they have to outsource to, 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 to meet the demand. So if they can acquire the machine themselves, it'll be cheaper for them. So it, it was very easy, very clear for them, you know, on one page, they captured much. Um, I would give another example of another one that is in the green category, which is considered strong, is... Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, please mute. Yeah, can you please mute your phone. Could you please mute your phone? Oh, sorry. If you're not speaking, kindly mute your phone. No problem. Just mute it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Hello. No, would you mute? We're still in the middle of a presentation. Oh, sorry. Kindly sorry. mute your phone and. and yes. yes. Let Michelle finish her presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go okay. ahead, Michelle. So what I was saying is that those that were in the green category, it means that they were very clear on what they want, how much they want, 
very realistic about how much they want and, and how it will move their business to the next level. Now, they, they, they already showed that they have existing revenue and this is what will make our revenue increase and increase our profits in the end. So it, it was very clear. That's why they found themselves at the green. Now, the next category was the blue category. Now, blue category, great idea. I mean, all of them were great ideas. But in blue category, they were able to show everything, but there was a but. You know, I'll give an example. Someone is in poultry farming. They, they began operations in 2018. So the company wants money to purchase land, um, establish a hatchery, be, uh, sales depot, and uh, the marketing of their products. So they, they are clear. They want $7,500. Very realistic, $7,500, and they can break it down for you. However, there is competition from others. And they're not able to, to, to explain how, what is their co competitive advantage against the competition. So just that one point, you know, on a brief summary, put them on the, it's a good idea, but are you able to, you know, it, 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 it's a good idea, it's okay, but it's under monitoring because you're not able to explain one or two things. I will give another example. Um, Rice farming, agribusiness. So we have someone established in 2018. So they need $34,000 to develop a modern rice farm and processing center. Okay, they were clear about that. Now the owner already owns the land. They have revenue protections and they have established that they have good, you know, a high demand. The market is there and everything is ready. However, the company is yet to embark in such a project. That's cause, you know, there is no prior experience showing that if they get the processor, you know, they, they, they need to show something for it, something, some little experience about it. And also the competitive advantage is not so clear. And the off takers are also not so clear. So yes, the demand is there, but how, how are you, what are your distribution call, you know, it, it, there, there are some few things that are just not so clear. Your marketing and distribution, your branding, once you do the processing. So it, it's a good idea, but you need to be very clear about it. Now, some businesses found themselves in the yellow. And I will give a few examples. So someone wants $10,000 for greenhouse farming. And they are very clear. In fact, they, they were clear they want to construct a greenhouse, drill a borehole, purchase an overhead tank, purchase water pump, purchase the seeds, you know, the labor, they're very clear and $10,000 is practical. Great. <laughs> However, there's no experience in agriculture. You know, they, they or rather even if they do have experience, they've not said it. So we don't know if they have experience, they themselves as the project owners, or if the, they have ever even had a shed where they had some little seedlings and they grew them. I mean, they, there's really, we don't have something to work with as experience to show that they started somewhere and did this revenues. You, you, the idea is fantastic and it's good, but you need to show, you know, your, your experience in the area, the revenues, and how you plan mm -hmm. on growing those revenues, right? So they found themselves in the yellow just because they're not able to elaborate themselves. So sometimes, the ideas are great and everything. You will get your results. Now, all this will come after the call. So you will get your results after the call. They will come through your team leaders. And no matter the category you find yourself, it doesn't mean that's who you are. No, it just means that it, this was just based on the first page that we saw, which is the executive. And you have an opportunity to improve that. Where now I speak about the stages of review of this process. Now, there are two stages. The first stage is preliminary review, which is now this, we are giving you feedback on the preliminary review. And then the second stage is a deep review. Now under the deep, uh, deep stick analysis, we are, we have a checklist where we require you to return your summaries. Of course, please polish them and highlight, you know, take care of all the things we have given you feedback on and now give supporting documents to support your project. 
that, without further ado, I will go to checklist and checklist related items. And I would like to share my screen, starting with the frequently asked questions about the, the checklist, yeah? So we already anticipated some questions based on our checklist. I believe now we can all see my screen. Yes? Yes, go ahead, Michelle. We can see your screen. Fre okay. Frequently asked questions. Okay. Question number one. Is it mandatory to have all the requirements in the checklist? Now, it is mandatory to adhere to the maximum number of documents that you have. So as you had, I didn't say all, 100%, but the maximum, because the more you have, the greater your chances, that greater that shows that you have committed so much more into this project. Is it mandatory to add the industry required documents? Now, industry required documents are, we are, all, we are all in different industries. The checklist only has the basic requirements, but in different industries, we require different licenses. Yeah, we require different permits. So yeah, it is mandatory to adhere to your di different industry requirements. If you don't have it, you can just note that you don't have it. You're in the process of acquiring. You have receipts waiting for the uh, permits to come out, whatever. Just, just note that and say where you're at in the process. The third question is how far and deep should I go in submission of project details? Dr. Lolan saying it's like dating. Just be transparent. I mean, you, you want to get this person to invest in you, trust you. So just give as much information as you can. How many will be funded per country? As many as the investors deem fit. If all the proposals are amazing, I can assure you they, they will give you the money because they're like, this is the country I want to be in, you know? So just work on your proposal for consideration. There's a notion that many project owners submit all their documents, but very few get chosen. Now, submission of documents, uh, uh, it is not just everything you need to have you know even when you're pitching if you're able to present yourself very well in those few seconds and you you're catchy and all that and dr roland already gave us the highlights of what they want in in the few seconds that's it i mean just work on yourself your project your presentation and everything is okay because they they just want to satisfy their investment appetite and if you are it that's it that's all Number six is how confident are the projects being, or how confidential are the projects being handled during the virtual calls and selection process? The project proposals are only privy to the team handling them. That is when you submit, and they're not uh, privy to any other applicant, they're not privy to other organization. It's just for this purpose it's here. Um, what do I expect on the virtual call? The virtual call, you expect a preliminary feedback, which is what you have been getting from the beginning, and where the technical team will highlight strengths and weaknesses, which is what we're doing, of the proposals in the various sectors and what is required of you. Number eight is what, what is the next step of the virtual call and preliminary review feedback? The next step after the preliminary review is a second review, which I mentioned. And in the second review, you're supposed to sub, uh, submit extra documents that support your proposal as per the checklist. That's what I'll go into next. How do we address language barriers with the main language being English? Um, team leaders guide on that. However, I don't think Malawi has any of such. We are grateful that everyone was able to really be articulate about that. Number 10 is how many submissions will make it to the end? Everyone. Everyone makes it to the end. It's only you who decides how you make it there, how you invest in, in your presentation, how you invest in the supporting documents, how you invest in what is required of you. What features should my proposal have? Basic proposal has a purpose, an objective, the amount that is required, a breakdown of the usage of funds. Actually, I, I noticed that most, most of the uh, executive summaries from Malawi are very clear on the amount. Everybody gave up the amount they wanted. And that's a great thing that you know how much you want and how you're going to spend it. However, there were just a few of them 
who will find themselves in yellow that didn't do that and maybe because of the technicalities like yeah and and it's understandable so for those who are in 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 large construction uh, projects because those are some of those who are not able to do the breakdown on a one page executive summary you can do that in your feasibility study where of course you you give a proper business plan from beginning to end on how the project is what the project is about and how it translates into profit in the end um the other thing that is basic is marketing and distribution channels this is key many people left this one out because of i i from what i heard i think it was because of not so good research you know the, the, the research was not very conclusive so i i would urge that you take time from now till the submission 10th of july take your time to to do a proper research so that when you're returning them you can't return sooner than 10th of july but that's the deadline you have done a very good research and you know what, what's happening you know how you're able to tackle that competition and the same applies cash flow projections of course the summary could only handle a brief a brief uh, cash flow projection but what we require is extensive and i will explain it in the end now statistics of past performance this is explained through your financials evidence of past contracts done you know anything you've done in the past that re relates or translates to your project yeah so any any evidence of that and then of course supporting documents all of this will be captured in the second review what happens if i don't have internet access your team leaders will be there for you they will communicate just note be, be sure to speak to them and they will they will communicate the same how do i go about country statutory requirements now if you're not aware of the government offices to access you can speak to your team leaders who are really conversant with most of this project and the regulatory affairs they will guide more what do i need to do if i have projects in different countries well attend all the virtual tours for those different countries if someone already has an existing loan from a bank or a microfinance do they still qualify for funding yes you do however you just need to ensure that your financials are depicting they're showing how you have been paying for your past loan and how you plan to still pay for it and how you will repay your future loan how you will repay your future loan is shown through your cash flows your cash flow projections um number 16 is small businesses might not have financial audited accounts do they stand a chance yes they do however they do have management accounts yeah you have bookkeeping you have basic bookkeeping you need to show what you've been doing how you've been doing it your revenue your expenses and your profit the basics the basics and if you have acquired any assets just just list all of that and and let it be shown in your basic bookkeeping and a basic balance sheet uh, what type of funding is covered in this tour so it's debt financing equity financing and revenue share so those are the most common questions we get after I finish sharing the checklist. So I'm going to go to the checklist now. Uh, I will share the checklist page. Just a second. And these are the documents that we require to support um what we see on the executive summary and what we see on the feasibility study so this is basic this everyone should have this is no matter your industry this is just a basic checklist you will tick through what you have what you don't have and the reasons why you don't have or have or in the process of acquiring right just just indicate where you're at so application letter that's your executive summary which we are all going to polish and ensure that they capture or everything then number two is a well-documented proposal feasibility studies so that is applicable to everyone especially the large project um the other things are the statutory legal requirements for incorporating a business in your country which is your certificate of registration the corporation shareholders 
um, your memorandum and articles of association or related document, your certified passport or ID and tax uh, certificates of the shareholders and directors, CV of shareholders and directors. It is really important to share your CV as directors and shareholders. Your experience is, is, is invaluable and, and the investor really needs to know that. Um, the current management accounts, now three-year audited accounts. Again, small companies just indicate you have probably three-year management accounts or one year would just indicate what you have. We have cash flow projections for 24 months. I will come back to that one. The entity having obtained in its sole name all approvals, consents, authorizations, licenses, and certificates from appropriate authorities, institutions, and persons to conduct business. Now, as I had mentioned, you might not have all of them with you, but you're in the process of acquiring. So just list what you, uh, attach what you have and what you have already paid for, you have receipts, and what you're in the process of acquiring and what you think will come after you know some certifications come after after you know the plant is up and ready and it's just waiting for commissioning now number 11 is sources evidence of equity contribution documentary where possible if you're in construction please take photos of where you have reached and send where you the progress you have um you have bought land copies of that sale agreement you have bought equipment send your invoices receipts and anything related you have whatever you have done and then it's 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 important to note that your contribution should be a chunk of your total project you know you you, you have written in your executive summary that your project is three hundred thousand dollars fantastic now you have contributed a total of three fifty thousand okay about $100,000. So the difference would be $200,000. So that $100,000 should be evidenced in documentary, in, in, in something, you know, just whatever you have, whatever receipts you have to just show that this is my contribution to this project. Um, certificates of all mandatory contribution, that's tax. That's basically tax. So share your tax certificates. Now, environmental impact assessment, that is, that is for the relevant industries, construction, mining, you know, it, it, it's, it's only related if, if it's related to your business or project. Proof of legal registered address and proof of operational address. Now, some of you have rented space, land, I don't know, um, offices, and some are even working from their homes. So you need to have proof of where you're at. And proof of that is through either a utility bill that's in your name or in the name of the business, lease agreement that's in your name or in the name of the business. Um, I think those are the two basic things that show um, your registered address, yeah? Your lease agreement or, or utility bills something that shows that your business is there, right? you know, the location, we can find you through the location on your, on that document. Now, ID documents of members of the board of directors and senior management. So it's not in all instances that the shareholders are actually running the business. Shareholders could employ um, sen uh, management who have the, technical know-how of how to run this. They could just be shareholders and they're partnering. So please ensure if you have a board and management who are not, who are the ones who are actually running the show on the ground, please ensure that you share the certifications. Proof of address of the board of members, that's the same thing as well. Um, other than that, that's a checklist. That's a basic checklist. So you will just go ticking through that and writing what you have and what you don't have. It will also help you ensure that you compile your documents together before you submit. So everyone will get a checklist after this. And they will be submitted through your leaders. 
Now, the other thing I need to touch is industry requirements. So we will share a guide. Now, this guide does not mean that you should have everything here or you shouldn't submit something else that's not here, but it is related to your project. No, no, no. This is just a basic guide. It's a skeleton structure. You can fill it in, fill the meat if you have any extras, yeah? So like in construction, I started with the basic KYCs, which is um, the tax certificates, incorporations, directors, IDs and passports and trading. You know, those are the basics. But over and above that, we require to know any current litigation that the organization is going through. The partner wants to know that. Yeah, it's good to be transparent from the beginning and, and it'll be great for your relationship. Um, other than that, we have company profile, recent three-year audited accounts, which I already touched on in the checklist and how to handle that, management accounts. Now, if you already have debtors, please, your aging debtor list is great for the last 360 days. If you also have debtors over 360 days, just note them there because they will be reflected in your financials as uh, where you have a provision for bad debts. Um, we have uh, technical references of works performed in the last five years. If you're in construction, it's good to show what you have done in the last five years, yeah? And we have bill of quantities. If you're constructing, you already have the quote, the, the what, from your contractors. So your bill of quantities is, is, is a great document to show profiles and professional certification of project managers, surveyors, and engineers. I think I touched on that and the professionals working who are on the ground, uh, who are not shareholders. And uh, there's an important one there, a list of major assets and equipment owned by the company. It is very key that you list them with their values. List all your assets. And this is not just applicable to construction. If you have an uh, agriculture, you have a processing plant, list everything. Whatever sector you are, even if it's just furniture and fittings in your office, list what your assets are and what their value is. Um, more than that, we have an environmental assessment certificate. That's mandatory. That's really mandatory if you're in construction. And any other statutory licenses as per the country requirements. ICT sector has the basics. I think most of them have been depicted in the checklist of documents however if is you have any more unique certificates and permits that are not here because everyone requires a permit to trade but if you have anything else that is related to your business that is not here you are free you should actually add it on we have the trading sector now trading over and above the things in the checklist we have import export licenses if you're in international trade um economic diversification drive certificate where applicable and any other related certificates we have healthcare healthcare we require medical board licenses um the the staff uh, the key personnel licenses to practice import export if you're in uh, buying selling equipment uh, so anything that is related However, everyone is also required to share whatever litigations they may be having. Services sector, I think the list there uh, has already been captured in the, uh, in the checklist. However, if you have anything extra and above that related to the service industry you're in, please share the same. Hospitality sector, we have the basics. And then now in hospitality, we usually have many different things depending on whether you're in a hotel, to our uh, to our operators so differently you could have food handler certificate professional guide license trophy dealer license occupation permits environmental audit reports lease agreements just pick what is related to you and if you have any other additional just attach them certificate of airworthiness seaworthiness where applicable now i had mentioned that if you have a list of assets you should note them all on their and their value now like two operators will have vehicles and very many other businesses will have vehicles so you attach a copy of your logbooks you know just showing that that is related to your business it is part of your business in the if it's in the business name 
Yes. So you can attach your copy of the vehicles and indicate the value of those assets that you have. Um, the rest are captured in the checklist of documents. We have the agricultural sector. Again, just speak what is related to you. Is it an animal wildlife import license? Um, is it a um, horticulture permit? Is it a livestock permit? Is it a dried grains permit? Whatever it is that is related to the sector you're in. Manufacturing sector. Of course, we have that list which has the basics over and above that you could add the environmental impact assessment and any other statutory requirements dependent on the uh, manufacturing sector you're in. Financial services, of course, we need governing body licenses over and above the basics. So you capture that and ensure that that is attached as well and any other certifications that you might have. We have mining as well. And we have, so everything that is in this industry requirements is just basics. It doesn't mean that it's conclusive to your business. If your business requires any extra certifications, just attach them. That said, I think I have covered the checklists, the documents, and the next step where we go through um, a deep sea analysis using your supporting documents, ensure that you have polished and you have embraced the feedback that you are going to get after this. Nyakan? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think you've done a very, very good job, very clear. Um, one suggestion, Michelle, maybe, maybe you can also um, get the team to think about whether we should uh, create that Excel template for the cash flow analysis so that they just know and you have a standardized way in which you're getting that cash flow projections. Would that, would that help? Maybe you and the team can look at that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So they're yeah, so just receiving a standardized template, yeah, you know, in how they're presenting. Yeah. Okay. I think that would have value. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd love to open it up now for questions for Michelle and for Steve um, at this point. Yeah, Michelle, Steve, and Dr. Ron can respond. Go ahead. Somebody who wanted to ask a question, was it Itai? Rose, Rose, you wanted to ask a question? Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes I did. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is that um, depending on the feedback that one has been given, is there a chance that somebody can revise the funding they're asking for? That's my first question. The second one is on um, one of the things that um, Michelle presented. Uh, for the case of Malawi, for somebody who is operating in a rented place, uh, usually the utilities are in the name of the, of the owner of the premises. So in such a case, what would you advise? Would it be realistic? if uh, somebody uh, if the owner of the premises wrote some kind of recommendation and then you attach the utility bill i don't know uh, i stand to be guided thank you okay thank you rose um the utility bill is not the only thing that shows where you the location of your uh, business we have lease agreements uh, if you're renting maybe you have a form of lease agreement with them Rose? Yes. Do you have a lease agreement? Yes. You have a lease agreement? Hello? Hello? Uh, Rose, she's asking, do you have a lease agreement? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Rose. Okay. Um, I do. Um, it's it's a it's a bit of a, um, a challenging agreement. Maybe I should put it that way. But I think um, uh, probably a lease agreement can be produced in in cases where utilities are an issue. I think I can yeah. I can deal I can handle it in that way. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other question for Michelle and, and Steve? Hello. Yes, Talita. Yeah, my question is, 
I may have a very good project and I have all the requirements that are needed, but maybe I don't have the grace of expressing it in the way that I can attract donors. Can I use somebody to, who has that gift to present my project? Thank you. Yeah, so this is, so you, I, I guess you're speaking to, to the tour, the physical tour, the physical tour. Is that what you're referring to, Talita? Speaking in front of the investors. Exactly. Okay. So I will allow Steve and, and Michelle um, to feed in on that, uh, and then I'll give my thoughts as well. Go ahead, um, Steve, and then Michelle. Thank you. That's a very, that's a very difficult one because... <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand where she's coming from uh, because these, these, these investors obviously will be expecting you to, to present your proposal in English and uh, I mean you've got different levels of competencies in English and therefore you may not have a very persuasive language, you may have a very good idea but not a very persuasive language. Exactly. So I, th I think one of the first things is that by the time you get there it means that we are satisfied with your idea. Mm. We are satisfied right. with your idea. And therefore, we believe it, it's actually sellable. And probably there, there may be an opportunity for us to get to, to engage you further before that, those presentations. And uh, right. as I said earlier, you will not have a lot of time. Yeah? You just need to grasp the key things that you think those potential investors need to know to convince okay. them that you are here actually viable. So you can All do right. a practice by yourself. Yeah? You can <laughs> actually do practice and say, these are the things actually I'm going to talk about. In the okay. first two minutes, these are what I'll talk about. The next two minutes, maybe you've got 10 minutes. So you can actually practice in front of your, your peers, your colleagues, and by the time you get there, you know, you'll find that actually it'll be very convincing. I mean, because as an investor, okay. really, I want to see if you hear from the person who is going to take my money, not from, right. not from a proxy. <laughs> I mean, those are my. <laughs> okay, thank Thanks, you very much, nice. Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, your response on that? Uh, uh, what he said is true, but uh, you, I think being in this platform has is an advantage for you because the entire team will work with you and help you and remind you on the key highlights that you're just supposed to present to ah, attract ah. the investor. Because, as he said. You just have a few seconds to speak up before you know so don't worry about it and one thing i need to say is if you're in business yeah. don't ever feel yeah. like you lack anything because business is building your legacy for your children for your children's children and like even employment so you always remember that you have a competitive edge over the next pass just feel confident in yourself you you're in a good place because very many people don't even start Okay, thank so, you very much. Yeah, yeah. and so just to add on to what Steve and Michelle have said, I think that uh, you're luckier than most because the process that we have put in place, like processes such as these, very few people have, have, have you, know, you know, this kind of chances to work with a team of experts, brilliant people, people who really care and want them to succeed and are helping them to succeed. And, yeah. and just like both of them have said, you know, build your confidence, you know, in, in throughout today's calls, you've seen uh, the things that they're highlighting. What is your business? What's the funding amount? Yes. Uh, what do you want to do with it? You know, when, what are your revenues? Yes. How long will it take you to, to begin to make money once you get the investment? Once you focus on the key things, which our team is going to continue working with you and guiding you, you'll be okay. Dr. Roland, who, was, who, 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 who when he was speaking, said something in, important. He said that he has sat through boring presentations but even through that boring presentation, when he had numbers and he had things, he knew that there was value in that thing. Okay? No, no. So don't yes. be too worried about how other people are looking, how other people are speaking, the kind of language they're saying, and how long they're talking. Be more concerned about what you're presenting. Are you bringing yes. out the most important information that any investor would yes. like to do that? You know? And then, of course, we'll have you to build your confidence, and then you'll be okay. So, you know, investors are human beings. And, yes. and you know, technical teams like, like who you see here, uh, you know, Michelle, Steve, um, you know, we, we had from Valentine earlier, 
and the other technical people who've been on the calls with us, Dr. Roland, yeah. that through the, the, the talk, they see the information you're presenting, you look at, they're listening out for certain things. So as long as you're presenting those things that are, are you, know, um, you know, very important for decision making and for the investor to say, yes, I think there's something on this, you'll be okay. So, you know, you can get the person who's working with you, the one who you think, uh, have your, prex, your proxy, help them, you know, to prep yeah. you, help them to prep you, <laughs> help them to, you know, All right. get them to help you to, to prepare, you know, to talk, fine tune, right? You'll be yeah. okay. Thank you, you very much. Okay. You'll be okay. okay. Yeah. So Rose asked if, if you can revise the, um, the funding amount now that you're going into a second round of deep, deeper submissions. And can you also, you know, submit another proposal? Yes. The answer is a yes. And please take note of the dates, uh, the submission date, 10th of July. Okay. Any other question? Any Actually, other question? Nyakan, I can clarify on that. Rose asked if you can revise. We're actually expecting you to revise and do a proper overhaul of the executive summary based on the review. Yeah? So everyone should be polishing, Hello. polishing and revising everything to make it clear. Hello? Great. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, go ahead. Are you asking your question? Is there somebody who wants to Hi. ask a question? Hi, yes. Nyakan. I want to ask a question. Yes. Um, uh, okay. Uh, we have the color code as uh, the categories of green, blue, and yellow. Now, if you're a green, do you have to revise it? Yes, you do. You don't have to. Oh, yes. <laughs> Unless you feel that it, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's your proposal. If you feel that it's good enough for you and, and the feedback you're getting is it's good and you, you don't see the need of revising because it's very clear according to you and the things that we have asked you to put, then it's okay. But there are those who are in green, but they still need to revise a few things here and there. Okay. All right. That's yeah, clear. And, at least and what to I make it clear. Yeah, and what I would say, uh, Nasreen, the ones that are in green is strong. They were able at least to make it through that first round very strong. However, mm -hmm. based on the conversations we've had today, some insights, some new thinking, some new opportunities. Maybe you want to think, rethink the strength. You know, maybe you asked for a million dollars and you should have asked for two million, or maybe you yes. know you were thinking of of building a plant and now you're based on the conversations we've had today. You're going to use the money in a different way. You know, maybe you'll go, you know, just think about it based on the feedback that you received today, you know, and then strengthen it further. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Super. Anybody else with a question before we wrap this up? Okay, so, uh, madam. Uh, yeah. Okay, madam. Uh, yeah. You said that you said that there are three types of. Uh, investments so i would like to ask on debt or, or or a loan so uh, how are we going to pay back like pay back uh, pay back system how, how are you going to pay back uh, on on other question i would like to ask uh, on uh, color codes according to the color codes like green yellow and blue uh, have you put recommendations on the on those projects on, on those projects uh, exit summaries. Thank you. M Michelle, you can take both the questions. Yes, Bashir. Yes, we have given uh, recommendations. And as I had mentioned, no matter what color code you find yourself in, um, we are preparing you. So we have been a bit honest <laughs> in our response. When you read it, it's not to dampen your spirits, but it's for you to build that, to build and really work on that and know that that area is what well, it's not just limited, but you need to work around that area. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. There was another, there was another yes. question you yes. about uh, how do they repay the loans? 
Yeah. I think Bashir asked the question. Yes. But I yeah. think uh, actually, yeah. I think yeah, you want to take it? To, yeah, Michelle has alluded to it. When you do your final pr pr proposals, you need to indicate numbers there in terms of how much revenue you're going to make, what will your expenses will be, and how much cash you're going to generate. So in your cash flow that Michelle explained in detail, you need to show how much cash you'll get from your business to be able to pay your loan. So the loan is coming out of the trading transactions. So be very, very clear. If you want to go for a loan, your cash flows must indicate, I'll take a loan on this date, and this is the money I'll be able to generate to pay this loan and still be able to remain in something to uh, basically reinvest in the business. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank but, you so uh, much, Steve. I have a question and, here. And Bashir, hold on, Peter. Uh, Bashir, in terms of like interest rates um, and the kind of agreements that you will get into, I think these will vary from project to project and from you know agreement to agreement. Um, it depends on the, the risk, you know, some of the factors that are affecting your industry, your business, your project, you know, and the duration and the amounts, okay? So those will be fine-tuned when you're making the offers and you'll have the technical teams uh, available to guide you, okay? Yeah, and I think so, Salome, that has answered your, your, your question on the interest rate. I think earlier Dr. Roland alluded to, to the interest rates being about six to seven points above base rate and ranging between six and, and 12% and in the riskier areas about 14%. So, you know, those are just the general rates that, um, that I think they're looking at. But all these is, uh, is subject to, 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 to you know, the, 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 the uniqueness of each project, okay? Yeah, you're welcome, Salome. Okay. Um, any collateral um, arrangements? Um, I think that all these conversations will go based on your amount asked for and everything. I don't, I think, Michelle, when, when these questions have been asked in the virtual calls, I think the answer was no. Was it? Collateral. What I mentioned is that you need to list any of the existing assets that you have. Why? Because when a uh, someone is loaning you money, of course they want to see that should you not be able to repay, are we able to sell anything? Are we able to recover? So it's not that they, it'll be there in the beginning, but they just need to know you have such and such assets worth such and such, right? It strengthens your case if you're looking for a debt financing. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Peter. And Natasha, I think there was a question there, and then I think we could wrap up. Yeah, after yeah, that. Peter and Natasha? Um, some of us didn't get to present our proposals, um, so we wouldn't know how, how we have rated us according to the color coding. Um, and the other question is, uh, one of my pro the proposals that I submitted was something to do with uh, uh, non-profit. Non, non so I, I see that no one has tackled something like that. Um, I also want to, I would like to know if that proposal was, was going to be uh, looked at or has been considered. Thank you. Okay, Michelle, you want to take that? Okay. In terms of, uh, in terms of those who didn't get a chance to speak, in terms of those who didn't get a chance to speak, uh, the, all the preliminary analysis will be sent to your country teams and you will get the feedback so that you will know your color code, you know, you will know, um, you know, the, 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 the yeah, yes, I'm, yes, you will know the color code, you will know the reasons uh, surrounding your submission and you'll be able to work on that. In terms of grants, in terms of grants, um, you know, you're not for, not for profit. There's some there's some disruption on the call. Kindly mute your calls. Kindly mute your calls. You can speaking. Thank you so much. So in terms of um, you know um, your not for profit uh, proposal, Peter, uh, I'm sure the idea was great, and I'll uh, you know I'll, I'll let Michelle be what their team on that. Small question. Could you meet mute please? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? Okay. 
So in terms of uh, the not-for-profit um, uh, submissions and, and the you know, applications for grants and, and, and you know, donor funding in this round, the round of investors that are taking part in the funding tour are investor, not, they're not the investors that are giving grants at all or donor funding, maybe for later rounds when we have you know, development agencies and grants involved. Um, this round we'll be having investors who are looking at debt and equity or, or a mixed model of debt and equity. Okay, that's what they're going to be looking at, at, at in this round. Okay, so I hope that answers that part of your question. Um, Michelle? Um, Michelle, is there anything else that uh, you wanted to, to, to add on to that? No, 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 it, because our review team requires, um, you see, we have given you a checklist, which means you must have been in business somehow, you know? So uh, being in business means you must be making profit because we're asking you to show your profits. It, 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 and I've asked for cash flows and uh, Steve has clarified the cash flows need to show, should you get your debt? You know, it's, it's about your revenues, it's about your expenses, and it's about your bottom line. And the bottom line means you must be in a profit making business. That's all. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. So if there's no, no, no other burning question, I'd really just I've like to- I've got a question. To... I've got a question. Yes, Vinica. Yes. Yeah, um, looking at the checklist and uh, all the requirements, uh, they seem not favorable for starters. So um, I really want to know how uh, you would go about that. Because as a starter, uh, it would mean um, if at all I was doing um, that kind of business, then I, I might have been doing it uh, casually or something like that. Yet it's uh, it, it can be a great idea. Okay. Okay. So now I'd like you to speak to 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 that um, the checklist and what uh, startups can do. Because remember. We have two kinds of startups, the yeah, ones who are just, you know, idea mm -hmm. stage and there's those who are doing businesses. Even if it's, even if it's one month or two months, like uh, Dr. Roland had alluded to, you know, as long oh. as you're able to show that, you know, you're, you're, you're making money and you're growing and, and, you know, there's potential to that idea. So maybe Michelle speak a little bit to that. I will clarify when I mentioned that we need some financials. Now, if you're the startup where you are in small scale, I will yes. require you to do basic bookkeeping. Just oh. give us management accounts showing that you have been in business for the last six months, 12 months, you know. In fact, for two years, you're actually still considered a startup. For the last two years, if, if your business is at least zero to 24 months, you're considered kind of a startup because you don't have proper financials. So you should have basic books showing your um, income statement and a basic balance sheet if you have any you know assets uh, um, uh, liabilities and assets to show just basic just show that that's all okay what for people who have actually indicated that they've been in the business for less than six months I think I heard someone say that say that they've been in the business for less than six months what happens to that you know, funding, this type of, of uh, funding, it's, it's for people who have experience in the business and they can show that, you know what, I have a market and this is how the market has responded. And if I okay. do this, the market will respond like this, you get? Okay. So if yes. for three months you've been in business, you can give mm -hmm. us your three months basic bookkeeping. For the last three months, I have been able to do this. So if you help me here, I'll be able to do this much more. However, oh. now the amounts that you're requesting should also be realistic. Uh, Steve okay. has been mentioning about optimistic realism. Yeah, mm -hmm. so be optimistic and realistic. Okay. All right, thank you. Welcome. Alan, so maybe just one more question and then we can wrap this up. Alan, the last question from Alan. So for all of you who will still have questions, we have the frequently asked questions. You have your country leads, you have our technical teams. 
don't worry, we're walking this journey with you, okay? So should you remember any question after this call, you can refer to the frequently asked questions sheet that will be attached to your email. You can reach out to your technical lead and country lead. You can reach out to the our technical teams so that you have all the support that you need to answer your questions and to strengthen your submissions. So Alan, the last question, please. Uh, thank you so much, Yakan. Uh, listening to what Michelle just said right now, I feel like um, Naslin really has a greater job to communicate to all of us here in Malawi because he has mentioned something very important that we didn't know, we just realized it now. To say the people who are supposed to be active in this are people who have got experience. Because how we took it is that even people with ideas but they don't have support can take part. So like in Malawi, it's very hard. It's very hard to get a loan. And it's very, very hard also to have something you can put up as collateral. So we understood that they are investors, but somewhere in between, there is Tiwao. So how we, the image that we have is that this is more like an empowering initiative. Apart from a lending initiative, it's also an empowering initiative. So now, looking at the submissions that we are, are, are conveyed your way, there are about 70. And I know, and I know, because I've also been active amongst the group, that out of that 70, maybe just 10% or 20% are on the ground in terms of experience. Now, talking of progress, oh. like where we go from now, I looked at the checklist myself, and also we'll be meeting here. We've started our own monthly meetings. How would you encourage people who are involved but they don't have experience? Should they proceed? Or is there other initiatives coming in the future that will fit them? Because realistically, I know if we are to move on with people who are on the ground who can produce books, they have started already. The numbers definitely from 70 can go down to 20 something. And, and okay. yes, thank so, you very Anna, much. Let me answer, let me, uh, answer your question. Okay, thank you so much, Alan. I'll answer your question and I'll allow uh, Michelle also to build on that. So if you paid attention to, to what Dr. Roland was saying and what the other uh, technical people have been saying, even if you have an idea today that you're going to start, but between now and August, you're able to demonstrate that you have what it takes to make that idea work to make it make money. You know, you can even be selling from your house. You, you get it. That demonstrates a level of experience or along, you know, alongside that idea. There are people who started the businesses in January and they're saying, I'm already selling this. I have this market. I have these orders. I need to meet this. Demonstrating that somehow, you know, they have that experience within that sector or that idea to push forward. The second thing, Alan, you can think about is the people on your team. You may not have the experience to build your idea, but maybe you have people who have experience in that area of the idea or project that you want to run. And they can demonstrate how this idea will make money. And hopefully, you need to have started, hopefully. Um, at this stage, you know, between now and August, I mean, if, if you've not started anything, you may not be able to, to really be in this round. However, uh, based on what we're trying to do, the bigger picture of working with entrepreneurs goes beyond funding. It goes beyond financing. Indeed, there are going to be different funnels and different enterprises finding themselves in different categories. And we have subsequent projects that we de will definitely work with the different entrepreneurs that find themselves either missed out on, you know, on, on, on that funding space or, or the timing or, or, or some of the metrics that are needed you know, uh, to make it onto the funding you know, investor you know, uh, success rate for the, for, the, for the funding tour. There's other empowering projects and programs that definitely will work with your country teams to be able to empower you so that subsequently, not just for funding, but in other areas, you're growing as an enterprise, okay? So look out for that. Um, Michelle, maybe you may comment on the checklist um, as far as, you know, startups, startups that are already making money, okay? But maybe two, three months yeah. old, four months, five months, six months, yeah. Now, for startups that are already making money, what gives you leverage is 
like she has mentioned, you might be having orders. You might, you know, you might have a way of showing that you have market. You know, you have a ready market and they're waiting for your goods and you just need this ridge to cross over to supply to your market. And it will also help you grow as a business because it's not bridge financing, it's actually debt financing. So it's to scale you up. Yeah. And for those who do not have experience yet, I would tell you that you're an at advantage even attending this platform, following through, because this will help you, encourage you. And as you, because we have encountered like almost all industries in, in, uh, in the submissions and every time we have been sharing, the whole time we've been sharing, we've been giving different insights in different industries. So it's also been to your advantage of which I hope that you have grasped to help you grow. Do not be dampened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, we, with business, you need to have the passion in you. So don't lose hope. Never lose hope. If it's your dream, your dream will always come true. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Michelle. And you couldn't have said it any better. We're here to work with you. We're here to support you. We're here to cheer you on. We're here to encourage you. Remember, we believe that you know, every business began with an idea. So that idea you have is already a business in the making. You know, when you look at an orange tree, an orange tree does not just crop up to become an orange tree. It starts with a seed that was put on the ground that then became a big orange tree that produced a lot of orange fruit. So keep going, Alan, and all the rest of you great entrepreneurs, we are with you. And that we have, you know, something for everybody, for sure. We'll be working very closely with your uh, country leads to really uh, segment the various needs of the various um, enterprises that are, are, are actually uh, participating in this process. So without much ado, I just want to highlight the next steps. As, um, as Michelle has nicely said, that you're all going to receive emails, you know, from, from the technical team, highlighting the dates of submission, 10th of July. You will receive on that same email the attachments of the checklists, the industry sector um, guidelines, and the frequently asked questions so that you're, ab you're able to be equipped to support that. You will receive that. The next thing that you, you, know, you will receive through your country lead is, is the results, the preliminary results and outcomes of the first stage of submissions that will come from our technical teams with the color coding, the, 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 the green, the yellows, and the, and the blues, and with, with reason so that you can, you can actually strengthen your, your submission further. And then the third thing, once you submit your, 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 your updated uh, proposal and executive summary, you know, with a checklist and, and the documents that you are able to, 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 to attach with your submission, you will then uh, receive information on, uh, on details on, on, on registration of the tour, the physical tour in your country, and, um, and, and the location. So um, thank you so very much um, for, for, for your great participation. It's been a long, long, long um, evening uh, with you, but very, very enriching, very engaging, very fruitful and productive. Uh, thanks a lot to Dr. Roland for the great insights um, that he has shared on the call to just support and empower all the enterprises um, from Malawi. Uh, thanks so much to Steve, who has also shared uh, from his wisdom and his insights uh, as a financial consultant and, and experiences with, uh, with enterprises to just enrich and you know, um, all the conversations we've had today. Thank you so much to our technical teams, you know, in the back end represented by Michelle and the great work that you're doing with all these six countries um, and the submissions that have been made. Thanks to Molly, um, our regional timeless lead for working and facilitating and engaging um, interactions between the technical teams and our program teams and the enterprise countries. Really, really thank you. Thanks to your country lead, uh, Nasreen, who's done an amazing job leading all of you. Thank you so much, Nasreen, uh, for, for, for all the, the engagement and insights and leadership that you provided throughout this process and that you continue to provide. And last but not least, thank you so much to the enterprises because through you, Africa is going to be really great. Through you, through our enterprise development, Africa will fulfill her destiny, enter into her prosperity, and really unlock her potential, you know, solving problems, creating jobs and creating wealth. All this is pegged on entrepreneurship. So thank you so very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all um, very, very soon. I mean, we'll be talking on, 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 you know, virtually, but definitely Dr. Roland and myself and the teams that will be on the ground, will see you in August. We're very, very excited. 
Um, before I just close off the call, um, Nasreen, I'd like you to give your closing remarks and just share some of the thoughts you have. Nasreen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for staying um, this long on the call. Thank you for all of you support and thank you to TOL Kenya and all the team that is always edifying us and encouraging us and putting us uh, on the map and bringing Malawi on board. And we look forward to working with you and thank you so much for every time I call you, even if it's late at night, you always pick up the call and answer my questions to every, and uh, you've really been good to us. And thank you to the team of Malawi. I still look forward to working with you all the way and even more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathreen. So to all of you, have a blessed night and a wonderful weekend. It's been really a great time together. And I look forward to the next steps. All the best. Good night.